that furious struggle, Chancellorsville and the High Tide of the Confederacy, May 1st through 4th, 1863, by Chris Mikowski and Christopher D. White, published by Savas Beatty, read for you by Bob Neufeld. All rights reserved. The Emerging Civil War series offers compelling and easy-to-understand overviews of some of the Civil War's most important battles, stories, places, and personalities. Each print book in the series features dozens of photos and graphics, original maps, and visually engaging layouts. They're also useful as battlefield guides for anyone who wants to carry them out onto the field. The Emerging Civil War series is published by Savis Beatty in partnership with Emerging Civil War, a consortium of more than two dozen historians dedicated to connecting the public with America's defining event. Visit us online at www.emergingcivilwar.com. Chris Mikowski, co-founder and series editor. Dedications From Chris M. to Jenny Ann From Chris W. in memory of Dr. James Jim Good In Flanders Fields by John McRae In Flanders Fields the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. But now we lie in Flanders Fields. Take up your quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Fields. The authors jointly dedicate this book to our friend Richard Chapman, who will always be David Kyle to us. Touring the Battlefield The same roads that brought the two armies into conflict around Chancellorsville in May of 1863 continue to serve a great many people. For battlefield visitors, those roads can both help and hinder a tour of the battlefield. The organization of this book and tour reflects knowledge of those roads. It also takes into consideration related information, such as park facilities and the availability of parking. Therefore, in the interest of safety for those who follow the print edition across the battlefield, we will talk about some events slightly out of sequence. In such instances, we'll always be sure to let you know. Please keep in mind that Route 3 has two lanes of eastbound and two lanes of westbound traffic, and the roads are frequently busy. Please also note that some park roads are one way, others are not paved. All the park roads and trails receive year-round maintenance. Introduction He was in all his martial glory as he and his staff made their way through the smoke-filled clearing. Gray-clad soldiers to the left and right lifted their hats to cheer. To the front was an inferno, a once majestic plantation home now engulfed in flames brought on by battle. Minutes earlier, his nearly vanquished foe had abandoned the ravaged home and grudgingly withdrew to a new battle line less than a mile to the north. Confederate Staff Officer Charles Marshall painted a vivid scene. The fierce soldiers with their faces blackened with the smoke of battle, the wounded, crawling with feeble limbs from the fury of the devouring flames, all seemed possessed with a common impulse. One long, unbroken cheer, in which the feeble cry of those who lay helpless on the earth, blended with the strong voices of those who still fought, rose high above the roar of battle, and hailed the presence of the victorious chief. He sat in full realization of all that soldiers dream of, triumph. And as I looked upon him, in the complete fruition of the success which his genius, courage, and confidence in his army had won, I thought that it must have been from such a scene that men in ancient times rose to the dignity of gods. Unbeknownst to those at the time, May 3, 1863, would turn out to be the crown jewel of a thirty-four-year military career. General Robert E. Lee had reached the zenith of his career and was about to put the finishing touches on his most stunning victory. Over the last five days, Lee had lived up to the moniker Audacity Personified. 
His Union counterpart, Major General Joseph Hooker, had undertaken a bold plan in late April 1863. Hooker had split his army into three pieces. One piece, his cavalry corps, made a wide circle around Lee's left flank and drove toward the vulnerable Confederate rail system and capital. The Federal infantry force, seven full corps consisting of nearly 120,000 men, was split into two additional pieces. Hooker left three and a half corps in the Fredericksburg area to hold Lee's attention there, while Fighting Joe himself accompanied the remaining corps on a wide sweep around the Confederate force and into their rear. The Yankee general hoped to either smash Lee's badly outnumbered army between his forces or compel Lee to withdraw south toward Richmond. Our enemy must ingloriously fly, Hooker boasted, or come out from behind his defenses and give us battle on our own ground, where certain destruction awaits him. Instead of waiting for Hooker to fully dictate the course of battle, though, Lee came out from behind his defenses and indeed gave Hooker battle on his own ground. In the fight that ensued, Lee and his men outmaneuvered and outfought an enemy more than twice their size. It was a staff of legends, yet the chance for the ultimate victory, the destruction of the Army of the Potomac, was fleeting. By the end of the day on May 3rd, the core of Lee's army was in shambles. The casualty list topped 12,000 men. More were added on May 4th and 5th, bringing total Confederate casualties to 13,460 men. The list included some of the best and brightest Lee's army had to offer, including Brigadier General Frank Paxton, leader of the famed Stonewall Brigade, Brigadier General Francis T. Nichols, and Lee's offensive-minded right arm, Lieutenant General Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson. The backbone of Lee's army, his line officers, also were ravaged. In the end, when Lee had Hooker's infantry split into distinct pieces and their backs against the river, he was unable to land the killing blow. I was more depressed than after Fredericksburg, he recounted. Our loss was severe, and again we had not gained an inch of ground and the enemy could not be pursued. Despite that sense of frustration, Lee and his army had strung together a series of victories since the spring of 1862 and Chancellorsville finally offered him the opportunity to capitalize on that momentum. He seized the strategic initiative and launched another invasion northward. I thought my men were invincible, he would later admit. Certainly it must have felt that way, as Lee rode into Chancellorsville clearing on May 3rd, with his men around him cheering wildly, their faces smeared with gunpowder, smoke, sweat, and blood. They had overcome incredible odds, they were at the very apex of their power. Lee had no way to know how literally true that was. His army was at the apex of its power. These men had reached their high tide. After Chancellorsville, Lee's Army of Northern Virginia would never again win an offensive battlefield victory. Lee's greatest opportunity to destroy his longtime nemesis, the Army of the Potomac, had slipped through his fingers, and he would never have such an opportunity again. What will the country say? Oh, what will the country say? President Abraham Lincoln, following the Battle of Chancellorsville. Prologue, The Wounding of Stonewall Jackson, May 2nd, 1863. Night had set in, and the attack had faltered. The full moon rising above the tree line couldn't pierce the gloom of the wilderness, thicker than even the impossibly thick foliage. The plank road, which cut through the region, would have provided a clear, well-lit avenue for the reconnaissance party, but it would also have left them exposed to enemy fire. Instead, their guide, a nineteen-year-old private from the Ninth Virginia Cavalry named David Kyle, led them down a lesser-known path called the Mountain Road, which didn't show up on the maps. Kyle knew the road because he'd grown up in those parts, on the Bullock Farm, in fact, just a mile away. Thomas Chancellor claimed that he, Kyle, knows every hog path. This was literally his backyard. At the head of the party rode Confederate Lieutenant General Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson. Leery of this uncharted territory, he told Kyle to lead the way, but the general was soon satisfied that Kyle wasn't leading them into a trap. He trotted his horse past Kyle's and continued down the mountain road, his seven staff members following closely. Behind them lay the main Confederate battle line of Brigadier General James Lane's North Carolina Brigade, 
which was straddling the plank road and the mountain road. Ahead of the riders, somewhere in the gloom, the 33rd North Carolina Infantry stood vigil as pickets. Jackson's staff cautioned him about moving too far into the gloomy woods ahead of the main battle line. The danger is all over, the steely-eyed general retorted. The enemy is routed. Go back and tell A.P. Hill to press right on. Jackson then led his staff a couple of hundred yards down the mountain road, not quite reaching the picket line, and they stopped. And Jackson listened. For the past four hours, Jackson and the twenty-eight thousand Confederates under his command had been pushing the Union Army back through these woods after a surprise attack on the unprotected Union right flank. Jackson had led his entire Second Corps on an all-day march through the wilderness of Spotsylvania County to get into position. When he launched the attack at 5.15 in the afternoon, he caught most of the Union army off guard. While the Confederates did face some resistance, Jackson pressed the attack forward as aggressively as possible, until nightfall and the wilderness itself sapped away Confederate momentum. Jackson wasn't ready to quit, though. He wanted to give his men the chance to regroup, and give reinforcements the chance to move up, and then he wanted to renew the advance. As he sat on his horse, under the dark canopy of trees along the mountain road, listening through the forest, the sounds he heard confirmed his fears. Chopping, digging, shoveling. Union soldiers, only a few hundred yards ahead, were building entrenchments to resist the next Confederate attack. And attack he must. He had to reunite his half of the army with the half commanded by General Robert E. Lee, still on the far side of the battlefield, more than two miles from Jackson's current position. The Union army, trapped between the Confederate wings, was vulnerable, but likewise, the Confederate army, separated as it was, was also vulnerable. Jackson could wait until morning, but then his men would have to storm positions the Union army would have spent all night fortifying, or he could launch a risky night attack now while the Union army was still off balance. He liked his chances now. Jackson turned his horse back toward the main Confederate line, and then, the night erupted in fire. Earlier in the evening, as the Confederate advance had swept forward, a regiment of Union cavalry, the 8th Pennsylvania, suddenly burst from the woods along the plank road. Finding themselves trapped between the Confederate skirmish line and the main battle line, their commander, Major Panic Huey, ordered, Draw sabers and charge! They wheeled toward the east in an attempt to break out, but were repulsed. They reversed direction, and tried to charge the main battle line, but again met a withering volley. The survivors scattered into the woods on both sides of the road and were able to make their way back to Union lines, leaving behind thirty-three casualties and a pile of eighty dead horses. A short time later, to the south of the plank road, the 128th Pennsylvania Infantry attempted to close a gap in the Union battle line along the plank road. Lost in the woods, as dark was setting in, they slipped in unseen between the Confederate picket line and the main battle line. After brushing up against the 7th North Carolina Infantry, Lieutenant Levi Smith tried to talk his keystoners out of their predicament, but to no avail. He and more than two hundred fellow Pennsylvanians went rearward as captives, along with rumors of Yankees roaming around out in the dark woods. First enemy cavalry, now enemy infantry. Enemies, it seemed, lurked everywhere. No one could tell friend from foe, nor see a hidden enemy a rod away, a Union officer said. Still charged with adrenaline from their attack, but with nowhere to go once their advance had halted, the Confederates seemed especially jumpy. Individual soldiers fired at shadows, at strange sounds, at phantom enemies. At the south end of the line, skittish Confederates fired into the brush, spooking the men to their left, who likewise fired into the brush. A series of shots picked up momentum and sizzled up the Confederate line like a firecracker fuse. Just as Jackson and his men were returning from their reconnaissance, the Confederate fire rolled across Jackson's front, catching Jackson and his men. Stop! cried one of Jackson's staff officers, his brother-in-law, Joseph Morrison, whose horse had been shot out from beneath him. You're firing into your own men! It's a lie! growled Major John D. Barry of the 18th North Carolina, posted along the Confederate battle line. Pour it into them, boys. One of Jackson's staff members, William Cunliffe, fell dead. Another, Joshua Johns, fell wounded. Three bullets struck Jackson. One of the wounds in the palm of his right hand would prove relatively minor. The other two wounds in the left arm would prove much more serious. 
Along the plank road, one of Jackson's subordinates, Major General Ambrose Powell, A.P. Hill, had been leading a reconnaissance party of his own. His staff, caught in the rolling thunder that swept up the line, suffered far more grievously than Jackson's. Of the nine men with him, only Hill remained unscathed. The others lay dead or wounded, or had their horses bolt eastward into enemy lines. Jackson's staff evacuated the general from the field only with difficulty. The sounds of the Confederate muskets had alerted Federal artillerymen to their presence, and soon the cannoneers opened fire on the Confederate position. Hill, who took command following Jackson's accident, was injured by one of these artillery blasts. Jackson's other two division commanders, Brigadier Generals Robert Rhodes and Raleigh E. Colson, were both too inexperienced to lead the entire Second Corps, so Hill sent for Confederate cavalry commander Jeb Stuart to take charge. It would be hours before Stuart could arrive on the field, though. When he finally did, he inherited a situation he knew almost nothing about. The man best suited to brief him, Stonewall Jackson, was out of the action, under the surgeon's knife, having his left arm amputated at a field hospital four miles to the rear. Thus ended the fighting on May 2nd, 1863. The Confederate army sat dangerously divided, and with part of its leadership in disarray. The Union army, rocked back on its heels but not defeated, had time to regroup. The Battle of Chancellorsville was far from over. In fact, the most serious fighting had not even begun. At the Chancellorsville Battlefield Visitor Center Chronologically, Jackson's wounding takes place between chapters 10 and 11. Visitors today can have a difficult time understanding the story of Jackson's wounding because the landscape around the visitor center has changed so dramatically since 1863. The visitor center itself, constructed in 1963, obliterated much of the old mountain road trace, which ran right through the building's current location. For years, the National Park Service's philosophy dictated that visitor services be located as close to the battlefield's most important action as possible. From a preservation standpoint, of course, that philosophy proved highly disruptive, and current practices now steer away from such intrusive placement. Fortunately, an original section of the mountain road still exists. In 2007, the park restored part of the road trace by improving the grading and drainage. In 2012, it further stabilized the road by installing a surface made of recycled rubber. From the northeast corner of the building, a walk of less than a hundred feet will take visitors down to the mountain road. A sign at the far end of the road marks the approximate location of Jackson's farthest advance. It was there he stopped to listen to the Union soldiers as they worked. The Confederate picket line, also ahead of him through the forest, would have been located approximately where the eastern entrance into the parking lot turns in from Route 3. While the mountain road now looks much as it did in 1863, much else is different. Most importantly, the forest has matured. The trees today are considerably larger than they would have been in 1863. This entire section of Virginia, 70 square miles of it, was known as the wilderness because of the dense second-growth forest that grew there. The forests had previously been clear-cut to support the local iron ore industry, but by the spring of 1863 a second-growth forest had sprung up. The foliage was shorter and denser than it is now, packed with clinging vines, prickly thorns, scrubby brush, and whip-like saplings, all of it thick and lush and fighting for light. It was, as one officer described it, a wilderness in the most forbidding sense of the word. Tucked behind the visitor center, almost along the edge of Route 3, stands a monument to Jackson. Dedicated in 1888, the monument was placed in its present location to mark the area, although not the exact spot, where Jackson was wounded. At the time, some disagreement arose about the exact location of Jackson's wounding, but in the end, pragmatism won out. The monument committee wanted the granite structure close to the road so that passers-by could see it. Ironically, a hedgerow now hides the monument from travelers. Twenty feet away, a quartz boulder, placed there prior to the monument's construction, served as the area's first marker. Bullock Road, which runs along the west edge of the parking lot and leads to Tour Stop 1, did exist at the time of the battle. A pair of North Carolina regiments, the 28th and 18th North Carolina, the unit that accidentally shot Jackson, lined up along the far side of the road. The main Confederate battle line also stretched through the woods on the south side of the Plank Road, modern Route 3, although the road that's there today, Stuart Drive, did not exist at the time of the battle. <laughs>
On the far side of Bullock Road, the western loop through the Chancellorsville History Trail, which is only six-tenths of a mile, winds through the forest toward a set of Union trenches. The trenches were constructed by the Union Third Corps, but were abandoned when the Corps moved south toward Catherine Furness late on the morning of May 2nd. You'll hear about that in Chapter 8. Had the Third Corps remained in this vicinity and been manning those trenches when the Confederate flank attack swept through this area, they might have been able to blunt the effects of Jackson's attack. The eastern loop of the Chancellorsville History Trail leaves from the Visitor Center parking lot near the picnic area. The trail, which is clearly marked and well-maintained, runs through a dense patch of forest for about eight-tenths of a mile before coming out in a clearing near the ruins of the Chancellor House. The walk offers a fairly good glimpse of the kind of forest soldiers from both sides were trying to fight through. Chapter 1 The Road to Chancellorsville, April 1863 They filed into the wilderness in long blue lines, marching four abreast, sixty thousand in all. They flowed over the Rapidan and Rappahannock rivers from the north, across U.S. Ford, Ely's Ford, and farthest to the west, Germana Ford. The Union Army's morale was higher than it had been in months. Following the catastrophe at the Battle of Fredericksburg the previous December, when it had suffered some thirteen thousand casualties in a series of vain attacks against fortified Confederate positions, and then the humiliation of the Mud March in January, when its attempt to flank the Confederate army bogged down in soupy roads and terrible weather, the army's morale had sunk to near despair. Lieutenant Colonel Rufus Dawes considered the winter of 1862-63 the Valley Forge of the War. That had all changed, though, when President Lincoln promoted Major General Joseph Hooker to the command of the Army of the Potomac. I have heard, in such a way as to believe it, of your recently saying that the army and the government needed a dictator, Lincoln wrote to Hooker when making the appointment. Of course, it is not for this, but in spite of it, that I have given you command. Only those generals who gain successes can set up dictators. What I now ask of you is military success, and I will risk the dictatorship. Lincoln pointed out that there were things about Hooker he was not quite satisfied with, but he also offered his new commander praise. I believe you to be a brave and skillful soldier, which, of course, I like. You have confidence in yourself, which is a valuable, if not an indispensable, quality. You are ambitious, which, within reasonable bounds, does more good than harm. Hooker had earned a reputation as a hard fighter, a reputation cemented by a nickname to match when a newspaper headline accidentally omitted a dash from a correspondent's report. Fighting. Joe Hooker. The misprint ran as Fighting Joe Hooker, and the nickname stuck. Hooker himself disliked the moniker because he thought it made him sound too rash, but his men loved it. Following his promotion to commanding general, Hooker's first order of business had been to reorganize the army and rebuild morale. As soon as Hooker assumed command, fresh supplies began to roll into the army's camps in Stafford County, Virginia, on the north side of the Rappahannock. Hooker had bake ovens installed, and soon the men had fresh bread four days a week. Some camps received oysters and champagne. Men were given furloughs to go home and visit loved ones. Morale soared, and so did the confidence the fighting men had in fighting Joe Hooker. The army was never in a better condition for fighting, one officer said. The discipline is capital, the number of sick remarkably small, confidence in our commanding general is rapidly growing, and the men look upon him as of sterner stuff. I think there never was a general, said Bonaparte, who ever had their army more directly under their eye, as it were. Every department receives his attention, and there seems to be no item, however trifling it may appear, but that receives his attention. This, even the most ardent McClellan worshippers, are forced to acknowledge. By spring, Hooker had devised a plan to engage the Confederate Army, which still sat in its winter camps on the far side of the Rappahannock River in the heights beyond Fredericksburg. Hooker would leave a portion of his army behind as a decoy to keep the Confederates in place while the bulk of his force marked north and west, and then swung down around behind the unsuspecting Confederates, either trapping them against the river in Fredericksburg, or forcing them to retreat toward Richmond and out into the open. Hooker's cavalry, meanwhile, would slip to the south of the Confederate army and disrupt their lines of communication and supply, which would leave Confederate General Robert E. Lee no choice but to engage in battle. Hooker's cavalry, meanwhile, would slip to the south of the Confederate army and disrupt their lines of communication and supply, 
which would leave Confederate General Robert E. Lee no choice but to engage in battle. My plans are perfect, Hooker declared, and when I carry them out, may God have mercy on General Lee, for I will have none. And so, on Tuesday, April 27th, 1863, Hooker began a long, circuitous march to outflank the Confederates. Forty-two thousand men slipped quietly out of their camps, leaving behind twenty-five thousand men as decoys. On April 29th, Hooker shifted more men around to add to his ruse. He sent twenty thousand men across the Rappahannock, south of Fredericksburg, with another forty-five thousand men on the federal side of the river as support. Those men, under the command of Major General John Sedgwick, had the job of holding the Confederate Army's attention, while Hooker led the bulk of the army on its northwesterly sweep. In the meantime, Hooker's mobile wing, his newly reorganized cavalry force, under George Stoneman, sliced south of Lee's army, cutting telegraph wires, destroying rail lines, and causing as much confusion as possible. Hooker hoped that Lee would either be crushed between his hammer approaching from Chancellorsville and his anvil awaiting at Fredericksburg, or that Lee would be forced to fall back toward the Confederate capital of Richmond. Hooker's plan resembled the one Major General Ambrose Burnside had tried to execute in January, the ill-fated mud march that proved to be Burnside's undoing. The weather notwithstanding, the plan itself had been sound, sound enough that Hooker, when he carried it out, met with surprising success at the earliest stages of his march. The plan depended on speed and secrecy, which Hooker achieved. His men moved some forty miles in three days, splitting into three separate columns to avoid congestion. The soldiers, glad to again be on the move after months in camp, and ready to redeem that dreadful loss in December, marched with high spirits. They sang, The Union boys are moving on the left and on the right. The bugle call is sounding. Our shelters we must strike. Joe Hooker is our leader. He takes his whiskey strong. So our knapsacks we will sling and go marching along. On April 30th, lead elements of Hooker's army crossed at Ely's Ford. A Confederate brigade, guarding the approach from the ford, tried to delay the Union advance. My men were very anxious indeed to fire at them, wrote Lieutenant Colonel Edward M. Field, commanding the 12th Virginia Infantry. Field deployed his men near the Bullock Farm and waited for the Northerners to approach. The enemy soon came forward from the woods on the opposite side of the field, where the heavy force of cavalry had moved down on us, Field said. When the Union skirmishers advanced to within about 250 yards, Field gave the order for his Virginians to fire and of the two hundred fifty muskets, not a single one fired, Field said. Rain had fouled the muskets. The strain of that moment was the most severe that I had during the war, he admitted. Federals advanced, as the Confederates hurriedly cleaned and reloaded, getting off enough scattered shots to stop the advance long enough for Field's men to escape. Hooker's army moved onward. At the Bullock Farm with so much construction and development in the area today, it's hard to imagine that the wilderness was once one of the most rugged parts of Virginia. Despite its name, though, the wilderness was not entirely wild. A number of small farms, such as the one located here, owned by Oscar Bullock, had been cut out of the rough, second-growth jungle. Bullock owned three hundred acres in the wilderness of Spotsylvania County. On this property he constructed a modest two-and-a-half-story home, where he lived with his wife, Catherine, their two children, Thomas and Jesse, and Catherine's brother, David Kyle. The Bullocks owned five slaves, who lived in a nearby cabin. When the Battle of Chancellorsville erupted, Bullock was serving in the 30th Virginia Infantry, Kyle was serving in the 9th Virginia Cavalry, and Catherine and the children remained in the home. Imagine standing on the porch of your farmhouse as a massive column of soldiers swept by. They came from Ely's Ford, up the road to the left, and marched down what is now modern state route 610 toward Chancellorsville, an intersection another six-tenths of a mile to the right. On the night of April 30th, after the army had halted its march for the day, soldiers from the Union Second Corps bivouacked on this property. On May 1st, Federals set up a field hospital in the house. Operating tables were improvised by detaching some of the doors from their hinges, with the addition of a few boards found about the premises, wrote the Third Corps' medical director. When the house came under Confederate fire, the surgeons moved their hospital closer to the ford. On May 3rd, the Union Army passed this way again as it fell back from the Chancellorsville intersection, some of the men demoralized by defeat, others enraged 
although impotent, to do anything about it. Hooker set up his headquarters next to the Bullock House, then moved inside the newly constructed fortifications built by his men on the far side of the road. Remnants of those protective earthworks still remain, and the hiking path across the road follows a stretch of that federal line. The presence of the armies meant ruin for the Bullocks. My home was entirely destroyed, Catherine wrote a few months after the battle. The house torn down from necessity, entrenchments cut all over the place, my servants all gone to the Yankees. I am now left without any support but the labor of my own hand. CHAPTER Two: THE MOST IMPORTANT CROSSROADS IN AMERICA APRIL 30th, 1863 As the columns of Union soldiers curled south, they aimed toward the crossroads of Chancellorsville, a tavern that sat at the intersection of Ely's Ford Road and the Orange Turnpike, some ten miles west of Fredericksburg. The two-story brick mansion, built in the early 1800s, had served for decades as a tavern and inn, but by the spring of 1863, with traffic on the roads only a fraction of what it used to be, the house served primarily as a private residence for Frances Chancellor and her six daughters. Spearheading the movement down Ely's Ford Road, past the Bullock House, marched the men of Major General George Gordon Meade's Fifth Corps. Four ladies in light, attractive spring costumes, came out of the Chancellor House to scold the men as they marched by, one Union soldier wrote. They were not at all abashed or intimidated. They scolded audibly and reviled bitterly. Meade himself arrived at Chancellorsville on the afternoon of April 30th, joined soon after by Major General Henry Slocum, who had crossed with his Twelfth Corps at Germana Ford to the northwest, and now marched toward the crossroads along the Orange Turnpike. This is splendid, Slocum, Meade said to his colleague, still eyeing the path eastward. Hurrah for old Joe! We are on Lee's flank, and he does not know it. But just then Hooker called off the advance. He wanted to give the army time to concentrate. Meade, in a letter to his wife that evening, expressed his disappointment. We are across the river and have outmaneuvered the enemy, but we are not yet out of the woods. Meade spoke both figuratively and literally. Fredericksburg still lay twelve miles away. Hooker, however, felt no need to hurry. He had the Confederates right where he wanted them. The rebel army is now the legitimate property of the Army of the Potomac, he said. Hooker sent a message to his men, congratulating them on their success thus far. It is with heartfelt satisfaction the commanding general announces to the army that the operations of the last three days have determined that our enemy must ingloriously fly, or come out from behind his defenses, and give us battle on our own ground, where certain destruction awaits him. At the Chancellor House Despite its name, Chancellorsville was nothing more than a large brick home, sometimes used as a tavern and inn, built at an important crossroads that met in the eastern half of the wilderness. The remaining foundation shows the outline of the house, which was actually built in phases. Construction began on the original section of the house in 1813. By 1816, the Chancellorsville Tavern, large and commodious for the entertainment of travelers, provided food and lodging for wayfarers heading up and down Ely's Ford Road and the newly constructed turnpike that ran toward Fredericksburg. In addition, the building later housed the post office. By 1835, a new wing, two and a half stories tall, was built, and after that, a storage area was added. The first owners of the house, George and Ann Chancellor, had originally lived across the road at Fairview. Following George's death in 1836, the big brick house eventually moved out of the family's possession, changing hands at least twice. However, by 1863, Chancellors had again reoccupied the house, this time as renters, and Frances Chancellor and her six unmarried daughters had opened the inn for business. In the early years of the war, Confederate soldiers stationed in the area frequented the inn, as much for the company of the young ladies as for the food. My sisters were very nice to these defenders of our country, and played the piano and sang for them, and they taught my sisters to play cards, which my mother disapproved, but they all seemed to have a good time, recalled the youngest sister, Sue Chancellor, who was fourteen at the time. When the enemy made raids into the area, the family's demeanor changed, Sue said. My sisters were cold and distant, she recalled. My mother had her whole crop of corn shelled and put into underbeds in the bedrooms of the house, and all of her stock of meat was hidden under the stone steps at the front door. There were several of these steps, and the top one was lifted, and the whole stock of hams, shoulders, and middling packed in the space underneath, and the top stone replaced. 
The remains of those stone stairs still sit in front of the home's ruins. Also of note at the Chancellor House site are the graves of two infants, a boy and a girl, both nameless, both of whom died in childbirth. Their parents, James and Etta Rowley, moved to Virginia from Texas in 1910, when the family purchased Chancellorsville and the adjacent 1,155 acres. Once more, for a time, the Rowleys operated the house as an inn. A grape arbor had once been located next to the gravesite. On May 3rd, the Chancellor House sat at the center of battle. On May 3rd, the Chancellor House sat at the center of battle. We will return to this step at the end of Chapter 13 for a closer look at how the military situation unfolded that day. Chapter 3 The First Day's Battle, May 1, 1863 As smoothly as Hooker's plan had unfolded, his army hadn't marched all the way into the heart of the wilderness unseen, or even unopposed. Confederate cavalry under Jeb Stuart had skirmished with the advancing Union troops as early as April 28th. Stuart found it tough to gather dependable intelligence on Hooker's exact movements, though, so the information he sent back to Lee offered only a vague picture. I owe Mr. F. J. Hooker no thanks for keeping me here in this state of expectancy, Lee wrote in a letter to his wife. He referred to Hooker, with a mixture of scorn and amusement, by the nom de guerre the press had given the Union general. Mr. F. J. stood for Mr. Fighting Joe. Because Virginia provided Lee with a home field advantage, Confederate sympathizers sent a stream of information in Lee's direction, augmenting Stuart's intelligence. Lee learned enough to grow worried. To better gauge the threat and protect his rear, Lee sent Richard Anderson's division, some 8,500 men, westward, to watch the fords across the Rappahannock. Ordered by Lee to choose the strongest line you can, Anderson deployed his troops along a north-south ridge line that cut across the Orange Turnpike. A small stream, Mott's Run, ran parallel to the ridge. Just to the Confederate rear, along the south roadside, sat Zoe and Baptist Church. Dig in, Anderson told his men. The Union juggernaut was coming. Even as Anderson settled into position, Lee put the rest of the Confederate army into motion. The main attack would come on our flank and rear, Lee had realized. Lee decided to leave 10,000 soldiers under Major General Jubal Early to hold the Fredericksburg position and serve as a decoy to convince the Union First and Sixth Corps who were themselves stationed along the Rappahannock as decoys, that the Confederates still manned the positions they occupied since December. Lee's plan violated all conventional military wisdom, which dictated that a commander never defied his forces in the face of a superior foe. Lee's numbers were already diminished because of the absence of Lee's second-in-command, Lieutenant General James Longstreet, who was detached with 18,000 troops to southeast Virginia to forage for the army and combat a Union presence in that region. Now Lee would divide his army once again by leaving Early's men in Fredericksburg, while the rest of the Army of Northern Virginia, roughly 45,000 men, turned its attention to Mr. F. J. Hooker. That gave Lee a total of 55,000 men, including Early's detachment, to bring into the fight against Hooker's 120,000 men. Lee knew he was sorely outnumbered, but he didn't necessarily consider himself outmatched, he could use the wooded terrain of the wilderness around Chancellorsville to entangle Hooker's larger force. He also had the element of surprise on his side, because Hooker still thought the Confederates remained hunkered down in Fredericksburg. Lee believed that if he hit strongly enough, he could do much to even the odds and allow himself, not Hooker, to set the tone of battle. Shortly before dawn on Friday, May 1st, Major General Lafayette McLaws arrived with 7,600 Confederate reinforcements to bolster Anderson's line. It must be victory or death, or defeat would be ruinous, Lee had told them. Then, around 8 a.m., Stonewall Jackson arrived on the field to take overall command. Lee had ordered his lieutenants to make arrangements to repulse the enemy. Jackson, ever offensive-minded, planned to repulse the enemy by slamming them head-on. Jackson directed McLaws to move directly west out the turnpike toward Chancellorsville and he directed Anderson to move in the same direction following the Orange Plank Road, which branched off the turnpike and ran roughly parallel to it to the south. As reinforcements from the Second Corps arrived on the field from Fredericksburg, Jackson told them they would reinforce Anderson and McLaws as necessary. It would be, wrote one Confederate, a supreme effort, a union of audacity and desperation. By the time the Confederate advance got underway around 11 a.m., 
Joe Hooker had decided that he, too, was ready for action. He ordered George Meade to advance two-thirds of his Fifth Corps toward Fredericksburg along the river road, which swept northwestward away from the turnpike before arcing back toward it near Banks Ford, a key river crossing five miles west of Fredericksburg. But, of course, neither Meade nor Hooker realized that the Confederate army had redeployed and now waited for them on the edge of the wilderness. Meade's main route of advance would, unbeknownst to him, put him in the vulnerable Confederate rear. Meanwhile, Meade's remaining division, under Major General George Sykes, moved east, straight down the turnpike. Along the Orange Plank Road to the south, the Twelfth Corps, under Slocum, also moved east. The blue and gray columns, advancing in opposite directions on the same roads, clashed at twenty minutes past eleven. The fighting was hot and close, due to the thick underbrush, said one Confederate. The two armies pushed at each other, but Jackson's aggressive nature couldn't compensate for the superior numbers of the Union Army, which fought well and began gaining ground. Confederates soon found themselves back near the fortifications they dug along the ridge of Mott's Run. And then, Hooker, suddenly, inexplicably, called it off. Later, after he had fallen from grace, Hooker tried to explain his decision. I lost faith in Joe Hooker, he reportedly said. The Confederate presence to his immediate east had caught the Union commander completely off guard. The Confederates, after all, were supposed to be twelve miles away in Fredericksburg. If his intelligence had been wrong concerning his opponent's location, what else might be wrong? It didn't matter that his subordinates were adapting effectively to the new situation. It didn't matter that his army was pushing the enemy back. It didn't matter that Meade had made it almost all the way to Banks Ford, virtually unopposed which would have put him in a position to drop down behind the Confederate army and wreak havoc. "'Call that a position?' scoffed Brigadier General Charles Griffin at the vanguard of the column, when told to fall back. "'Here I can defy any force the enemy can bring against me.' But fall back he did. "'I was hazarding too much to continue the movement,' Hooker later explained. Unable to adapt to the changing circumstances, he folded under the pressure opting instead to pull his army back into a concentrated position around Chancellorsville. The orders made little sense to any of the Union commanders. In no event should we give up our ground, one of them said. Along the plank road, Slocum, who felt he was getting the better of Confederates there, was astounded by Hook's order to withdraw, said one observer, and declined to take a verbal command for such an ignominious step. Staff Officer Washington Roebling delivered a written follow-up. He could not believe it called me a damned liar, and rode back personally to Hooker, who confirmed it, Roebling said. That action on Hooker's part lost us the battle before it really began. The rest of the day was wasted, doing nothing. The man went back disappointed, not without grumbling, said Brigadier General Alpheus Williams, and it really required some policy to satisfy them that there was not mismanagement somewhere. The advance was stopped, another officer later wrote. The Battle of Chancellorsville was lost right there. Hooker saw it differently. It's all right, he said to one of his corps commanders. I have got Lee just where I want him. He must fight me on my own ground. At the First Day's Battlefield The fields on either side of Mott's Run, today known as Lick Run, provided the first real open space on the eastern edge of the wilderness. For the Federals, getting into the open, would allow them to deploy their vastly superior forces in powerful attack formations and bring their full weight to bear against the Confederates. Conversely, staying bottled up in the wilderness would negate their numerical advantage by making it difficult to maneuver. For the Confederates, the open space provided clear fields of fire. They could simply hunker down in their defensive works and await the Federal advance uphill across open ground. Those Confederate fortifications ran along the crest of a hill to the east of their current position, toward Fredericksburg, beyond the White Rift Barn. Zornchurch sat along that same crest on the south side of the road. The modern-day Zornchurch sits there today. But Stonewall Jackson arrived, discontent to wait for the Union Army to attack the fortified Confederate position. Taking the offensive, he sent half of the Confederates down the road you just drove in on, and the other half down the Orange Plank Road, which ran roughly parallel to the south. Later in the day, when the Federal Army pushed the Confederates back, the Southerners grudgingly gave ground across these same fields. They finished the fight nearly where they'd begun it, but then Hooker recalled his army 
The Federals had finally succeeded in reaching their goal, the open space beyond the wilderness, when suddenly they had to let it slip away. The Second Battle of Chancellorsville, waged over this very same ground, opened on July 31, 2002. A coalition of seven preservation groups announced its opposition to a planned 800-acre development known as the Town of Chancellorsville that would include 1,995 homes and up to 2.2 million square feet of business space, all situated on property immediately adjacent to the National Park. In addition, a long-range transportation plan for the region called for a highway connector from Route 3 to I-95 that would cut across part of the battlefield. In March 2003, after intense lobbying by preservation groups and local citizens and a national petition drive that netted some 30,000 signatures, the County Board of Supervisors declined to approve the zoning changes that would make the development possible. Several months later, the proposed connector to I-95 was dropped from the long-range transportation plan. In 2004, the Civil War Preservation Trust, a national battlefield preservation organization, bought 140 acres of the property but another 500 acres got sold to a developer who planned to build luxury homes. The developer offered to sell another 75 acres of historically significant land to the preservation group at a substantially below market price, contingent on whether the County Board of Supervisors rezoned the remaining property to allow a few additional homes. Preservationists, developers, and tourism officials all supported the compromise, hailing it as a win-win-win scenario. The supervisors approved the change. A total of 215 acres of the Day 1 battlefield now stand protected. Plantings to restore the wartime tree line will eventually provide a screen, blocking the development from view while providing additional privacy for the development's residents. Chancellorsville is flat out one of our greatest victories, said one preservationist shortly after the compromise was struck. We hold this up as a model of what happens when everyone works together for the greater good. It's a wonderful success story. Chapter 4. Settling In. May 1, 1863. Hooker convinced himself, and tried to convince his subordinates, that his rationale for pulling back was sound. As the passageway through the forest was narrow, he wrote, I was satisfied that I could not throw troops fast enough to resist the advance of General Lee, and was apprehensive of being whipped in detail. His new position, on the other hand, would afford his men an excellent opportunity for victory. I felt confident, he recalled later, that I had eighty chances in a hundred to win. That was hardly the kind of morale booster that engendered faith in his subordinates. Fifth Corps Commander George Gordon Meade, known by his men as a goddamn goggle-eyed snapping turtle, for his looks as well as his disposition, would have none of it. My God, if we can't hold the top of a hill, we certainly cannot hold the bottom of it, he said. His protests fell on deaf ears. The Federal Army withdrew to a position anchored on the north, near the intersection of Bullock Road and Ely's Ford Road. Eventually, the left extended all the way to the Rappahannock River. The line then looped in a wide arc out around Chancellorsville and back up, in a half circle, to meet with the Orange Turnpike. From there, the Federal line extended westward along the Turnpike for two and a half miles. The entire position looked like a question mark lying on its side. Such a formation could not have been more appropriate. It perfectly matched the state of mind of nearly every Union Corps commander. As the Union Army pulled back, the Confederates moved forward to fill the vacuum left behind. By late afternoon, with the Union Army hunkered down into their question mark shaped line, the Confederates took up a position that stretched southwestward from the turnpike down along Furnace Road, a byway that got its name because it led to one of the area's iron furnaces. The Confederates weren't content to let their northern counterparts settle into their new position, though, and began to probe the Union line. The Rebs came over on the double quick, hollering like savages, one Union soldier said. But we had three lines up there, which stopped them very quick. Jackson still wasn't ready to call it quits. He looked for a way around the Union position, sending troops all the way down the Furnace Road in the hopes that they could find access to a piece of high ground called Hazel Grove. The Twelfth Corps had beaten the Confederates to the hilltop, though. A sharp fight ensued. The Federals prevailed, but we felt that we had our baptism of blood and commenced to realize the gravity of our position, one of them said. Jackson had been watching the action from a nearby knoll with Cavalry Commander Jeb Stuart. Stuart ordered some of his artillery pieces to fire on Hazel Grove 
in an attempt to help dislodge the Federals. But Union artillery from Hazel Grove answered the artillery challenge and began to bombard the knoll. One of Stuart's staff members was mortally wounded, although Stuart and Jackson escaped unharmed. And so ended the fighting on the first day. Nearly seven hundred men lay dead or wounded on the field. Joe Hooker's Army of the Potomac occupied the same basic position it had occupied the day before, but with one major difference. He now had the Army of Northern Virginia staring him squarely in the face. At McLaws Wedge McLaws Drive runs parallel to the edge of a field that saw more fighting during the Battle of Chancellorsville than any other piece of ground on the battlefield, because it saw fighting on all three days of the battle. On the first day, elements of the Union Second and Fifth Corps held the crest of the hill to cover the Federal pullback. They eventually fell back, too. Puzzled by the Federal movement, Confederates tried twice to push forward. But stout Federal resistance indicated that the Union Army had made a stand at the far side. Major General Lafayette McLaws settled in along this stretch of the Confederate position. Ten artillery pieces set up along the ridge for support. On the second day of the battle, Lee ordered McLaws to demonstrate all along his line in an effort to hold the attention of the Federal Second Corps and farther to the southwest, the Twelfth Corps. During that day and night and the next morning, I think we drove in their pickets ten or twelve times, wrote an officer from the Tenth Georgia. The attacks kept Joe Hooker and his army distracted from Lee's true objective, and when events unfolded elsewhere on the battle late in the day, McLaws's demonstrations prevented Hooker from pulling troops from this part of his line to reinforce the collapse of the Union right flank. On the morning of May 3rd, a Federal artilleryman felt encouraged by the previous day's action along this front. The rebels have got a good position, he admitted, but we think we will make them skedaddle. Our men made two splendid charges last evening. We are all in good spirits. The boys all go into it with cheer. They go on for victory or death. We have great confidence in fighting Joe Hooker. But it was the Confederate artillery that started the morning's fight. An artillery duel opened between Confederate gunners on Hazel Grove and Federal gunners at Fairview. Along the line here, McLaws also opened up with artillery. Lee ordered him and Anderson, located on McLaws's left flank, to push forward in an effort to connect with another wing of Lee's army. Pressed hard by the Confederates, the Federal line started to waver. Colonel Nelson Miles of the 61st New York Infantry rode out to steady his men when a bullet struck him in the stomach. The result was an instant, deathly, sickening sensation, Miles wrote. I was completely paralyzed below the waist. My horse seemed to realize what had occurred. He stopped, turned, and walked slowly back. Miles survived the wound and went on to eventually become general-in-chief of the army during the Spanish-American War. His actions at Chancellorsville earned him the Medal of Honor. McLaws's men drove their way across the field even as Hooker pulled back from his position around the Chancellorsville house. The Second Corps covered its own retreat skillfully, failing to let the Confederates swamp them. On a map, the field looks like a clear spot in the midst of a heavily wooded wilderness, but one Georgian called it the thickest woods you ever saw. A look at the map also reveals the ground's triangular shape, defined by McLaws Drive, Modern Route 3, and Old Plank Road, which gives the ground its current name, McLaws Wedge. The name was derived from a fundraising effort launched in 1997 by the Central Virginia Battlefields Trust, CBBT, which acquired the land and then turned it over to the National Park Service. CBBT has since gone on to preserve several other tracks on the battlefield, but McLaws Wedge was their first such effort at Chancellorsville, and their second ever. May God forbid that the time should ever come when the evidences which yet remain shall fail to recall in the generations following the reality and magnitude of the struggle and the costliness of the sacrifices by which the blessings of permanent peace, union, and liberty have been secured, wrote the historian of the 140th Pennsylvania quoted in CBBT's fundraising efforts to acquire the ground. The 140th Pennsylvania received its baptism of fire there. If you hike the one-mile interpretive trail across the field, you will see that the topography is deceptive. The field has high ground to the east, but three distinct draws cut across the middle of the field, making it impossible to see what's really out there. The draws also made convenient alleys for artillery fire, 
Confederate artillerymen placed across the turnpike to the north raked the flanks of advancing Union infantry, hemmed in by the draws. Chapter 5 The Cracker Box Meeting May 1st, 1863 By the evening of May 1st, Lee had made his headquarters near the intersection of the Plank and Furnace Roads. Jackson soon joined him to confer about possible courses of action. So quickly had they fallen into conversation that the two generals initially stood in the middle of the intersection to talk, but Union sharpshooters forced them off the road and into the protection of a small stand of cedars. There, seated on a fallen log, the two men continued their discussion. Because of the success he'd had earlier in the day, Jackson was convinced Hooker had lost the will to fight, or tomorrow morning, he said, there will not be any of them left on this side of the river. Lee wasn't so sure. Perhaps Hooker had consolidated his position in order to launch a concentrated strike. Perhaps he was drawing the Confederates into a trap. Perhaps he was refocusing his efforts for another attack in Fredericksburg. Perhaps— Lee knew he needed more information. He sent one of Jackson's division commanders, Major General A. P. Hill, to find someone who might know the local terrain. Lee and Jackson also summoned their engineers. They sent out scouts. They discussed options. How can we get at those people? Lee mused aloud. When Confederate cavalry commander Jeb Stuart rode into headquarters, he brought with him a piece of information that began to clarify the situation for Lee. The Union right flank was stretched out along the Orange Turnpike, with nothing at its far end to protect it. Lee already knew the Union army had secured its left flank along the Rappahannock, so attacking there would be impossible. An attack along the center would be difficult, especially since the Union army had spent the last few hours fortifying that position. In that light, the Union right sounded like a tempting target. But how could Lee get his army into position to attack there? Stuart rode off to see what he could learn. Lee and Jackson, meanwhile, leaned over Lee's wide map and began to formulate their strategy. As night crept toward morning, Lee and Jackson both felt the tug of fatigue. The details of their plan would have to wait until Stuart returned with his report. In the meantime, Lee covered himself with his overcoat and stretched out for a nap on a saddle blanket. Nearby, Jackson lay on the bare earth beneath a tree. A staff member later covered him with a cape. Jackson awoke two hours later, feeling chilled from the damp ground. He walked over to a nearby campfire that staff members had built, sitting on an old army cracker box. His chaplain, Reverend Beverly Tucker Lacey, whose family lived in the area, sat down beside him. Jackson explained the attack he wanted to make. Are there any roads, he asked the chaplain, that the army could take to get into position? Any of the routes he'd already considered would likely bring the Confederate army too close to Federal pickets which would ruin any chance Jackson had at surprise. Lacey knew someone who might be able to help, Charles Welford, who owned the nearby Catherine Furnace. Jackson sent Lacey and mapmaker Jedediah Hotchkiss to seek out Welford and gather what information he could. With Welford's help, Lacey and Hotchkiss ascertained the roads that led around to the enemy's rear, Hotchkiss wrote. In fact, Welford had recently cut a road through the wilderness that was so new it didn't show up on most of the maps. When Hotchkiss returned to Army headquarters, he found the generals sitting on a pair of cracker boxes that the Union Army had abandoned there early in the day. Hotchkiss pulled up a cracker box to join them. He then traced out the twelve-mile route Welford had shown him, a route that would take the Army past the furnace, then south and west through hidden ways that then turned northwards, and eventually linked with the Orange Turnpike just to the west of the Union right flank. General Jackson, asked Lee, what do you propose to do? Go around here, Jackson replied, indicating the route Hoskis had just traced. What do you propose to make this movement with? Lee asked. My whole corps. In other words, Jackson intended to march twenty-eight thousand men over twelve miles of dirt road to the far flank of the Union army. What will that leave me? Lee asked. The divisions of Anderson and McLaws. It was a huge gamble. Lee, with only fourteen thousand men, would have to keep Hooker's attention while Jackson marched into position. Firelight flickered across Lee's face as he considered it. Silent moments passed. Well, the commander finally said, looking up at Jackson, go on. Jackson smiled. At the Lee-Jackson bivouac site. It has become the stuff of legends, 
Confederate chieftains, Lee and Jackson, sitting on a pair of cracker boxes around a campfire, with orange and amber light flickering across their faces, mapping out an assault that would go down in the annals of history as one of the most crushing military blows ever delivered. Triumph and tragedy alike awaited them, though neither knew it, making the so-called cracker-box meeting especially portentous and poignant. Such a perspective, though, is only possible when seen through hindsight. Memory and irony have since imbued this meeting with a gravitas different than that which Lee and Jackson experienced. Certainly the two generals understood the seriousness of their situation, which, of course, gave their meeting an air of weightiness. But Lee and Jackson also understood that an important opportunity lay before them, and they were eager, even excited, to exploit it. Today, a pair of cedar trees marks the site of the Cracker Box meeting. The National Park Service planted the trees on October 23, 1937. Between them, set into a ground level stone, a bronze plaque acknowledges the commemoration effort and the symbolic significance of the trees. According to a former Park Service historian, Don Fons, Historian Ralph Happel was saddled with a duty of collecting donations for the tablet from other park employees, and, as a result, ended up paying about half of the thirty-dollar bill himself. Although he never forgot this assault on his wallet, Happel remained philosophical, claiming, They also serve who cannot collect. A two-feet-tall granite marker also adorns the site. Placed in 1903 by James Power Smith and H. General Jackson, the stone simply states, Bivouac. Lee and Jackson, night of May 1st, 1863. It is one of ten stones Smith placed in Spotsylvania, Caroline, and Orange counties to commemorate what he considered to be the most dramatic moments of the major battles that took place in the region. Chapter 6 On the March, May 2nd, 1863. Jackson's infantry had covered so much distance so quickly during the war that people had begun to call them. Jackson's foot cavalry. On the morning of May 2nd, the foot cavalry stepped off shortly after 7.30, row after row of them, four by four by four by four, twenty-eight thousand strong. The division of Brigadier General Robert Rhodes led the march, followed by the division of Brigadier General Raleigh E. Colston. The third division, under Major General A.P. Hill, would bring up the rear. As the head of the column passed the intersection of the Furnace and Plank Roads, Lee stood and watched them. Jackson, on horseback, rode up to speak briefly with his commander. They passed a few private words that no one overheard, and then Jackson spurred his horse, Little Sorrel, onward. He rode along his column with his cap held high in the air in silent salute to his men, who waved their caps back at him in equal silence, trying to preserve the secrecy of their maneuver. By eight o'clock, the column moved over a ridge near a little brick house. Beyond, the road began to descend to the low ground around Lewis's Run and Catherine Furnace. For hours our silent column swept along the road to the quick step, wrote Harrison Griffith of the 14th South Carolina, now turning right and now to the left. The contours of the land were such that the column, as it began its descent, was visible to Union artillerists, who sat up on the hilltop of Hazel Grove some three-quarters of a mile to the north. The artillerist spotters, perched in treetops, noticed the butternut column snaking across the road, and quickly sent word to their commander that rebels were afoot but it would take almost two hours for the messengers to move up the chain of command and for a response to return. Finally, word did come back, and at ten o'clock a pair of Union cannon from the 1st New Jersey Light Artillery rolled into position and began blasting away at the Confederate columns. Four other guns quickly joined in. The cannonade harassed, but did not harm the Confederate column. Jackson's men double-timed their way past the gap in the trees and continued down the road, down toward Lewis's run and ultimately to Catherine Furness beyond. In the meantime, Jackson ordered his wagon train to take a wider route further to the south to keep the wagons well beyond the range of the Union artillery. His foot cavalry had been on the road for less than three hours, and already Jackson's secret march wasn't so secret. At the Gap in the Trees The gap in the trees a visitor sees today along Furnace Road, looks much different than it did in 1863. The National Park Service maintains the gap to show visitors the contours of the land in the direction of Hazel Grove. However, the trees today stand much taller than they did at the time of the battle. The wilderness consisted of short, scrubby bushes 
and immature trees that hardly loomed as high as today's oaks and pines. The shorter tree cover offered a much clearer line of sight in the direction of Hazel Grove. Still, Confederates only had to march through the exposed position for a few yards before the tree cover and topography blocked them from sight again. The gap in the trees today represents the approximate distance and position that the Confederates had to cross under fire. Although the Union artillerists were essentially shooting down a narrow alley, their distant position made it difficult to fire with much accuracy, even though their ten-pounder parrots had rifled barrels. Rifling, whether in cannons or in muskets, typically allowed for greater accuracy because it put a spin on the projectile, which kept it moving on a straighter path. Chapter 7. Catherine Furness, May 2, 1863 Charles C. Welford had made a good life for himself as a merchant in Fredericksburg, but when the armies converged on the city in December 1862, Welford moved his family west to a property he owned in Spotsylvania County in the middle of the wilderness. Welford's property sat near another of his business interests, Catherine Furness. Originally built in 1837, Catherine Furness operated for a decade before shutting down, only to fire up again at the start of the war to help process iron ore for the Confederacy. To import ore for the furnace, Welford had recently cut a new road through the wilderness. It was this new road, which ran south from the furnace, that Welford had told Stuart and Lacey about the previous night. To the north, a road ran from the furnace toward Hazel Grove. The Confederate column reached the intersection shortly after eight o'clock. The area all around the furnace, which had been cleared of timber, gave an open reach and fully exposed the moving column to view, a Union officer later said. Indeed, Union gunners had spotted the Confederate movement, but by this point they had not yet opened fire on the column. Jackson worried that the Federals might send scouts, or something worse, from Hazel Grove toward the furnace. Jackson detailed the lead regiment from his column, the 23rd Georgia, commanded by Colonel Emery Best, to fall out of line and take up a defensive position some three hundred yards north of the intersection. The Georgians would serve as a screen, holding back any Union attempts to probe ahead. The rest of the column, meanwhile, hurried south past the furnace on the newly cut road. By one o'clock, Dan Sickles could hardly contain himself. The Major General commanding the Union Third Corps had heard reports of Confederates marching south of his position for almost five hours. At mid-morning he'd given the okay for his artillery to fire on them, but now he wanted more. For the past two hours he'd been pressing Joe Hooker for permission to advance against the Confederates. Hooker finally unleashed him, advanced cautiously toward the road followed by the enemy, and harassed the movement as much as possible, Hooker ordered. But Sickles planned for a bolder move. He first sent in the 1st and 2nd United States sharpshooters, followed by a full 3rd Corps brigade under Samuel Heyman. Sickles had no way to know it, but nearly all of the Confederate column had by now made its way safely past the furnace on the road south and west. Only a few artillery pieces had yet to pass. The Georgians, still in place to the north of the intersection as a precaution, held their ground against the advancing sharpshooters long enough for the final elements of the column to clear the area. As the Federals continued to push forward, the Georgians fell back to the furnace itself, taking up position around one of the property's outbuildings. Confederate artillery support slowed the Federal advance even further. But still, the Federals pushed, and they had numbers on their side. The Georgians, realizing their position was ultimately untenable, continued to fall back down the road. The firefight, tough and determined on both sides, soon attracted additional attention. Matt Catherine Furness The main stack of Catherine Furness still stands as the last remaining sentry of what was once a bustling enterprise. When the furnace was in operation, between six and ten buildings dotted the open landscape here. The furnace stack stood thirty-six feet tall. It measured thirty feet square at the base and nineteen feet square at the top, with thick fieldstone walls. Behind the stack, a dock stretched from the crest of the hill to the stack's open maw. Workers would wheel cartloads of raw ore across the dock and dump it down into the tower. With a full fire going, the temperature inside reached 2,800 degrees. The ore would melt down, and the workers would add lime to help separate the impurities from the molten iron. The resulting slag was skimmed off and hauled away. Much of it was dumped into the woods across the road. Meanwhile, workers poured the remaining iron into molds to create bars, also called pigs, 
that could then be transported off-site for processing. Anywhere between sixty and seventy slaves might be employed to excavate the ore, cut the wood, haul the materials, and operate the furnace itself. The enterprise also employed a manager and various skilled and unskilled workers. They would typically fire up the furnace for a four- or five-month period, called a blast, when the furnace would be in production. During the remaining part of the year, workers usually farmed. Catherine Furnace was one of several such furnaces, the first dating back as early as 1718, established in this region because of the rich supplies of iron ore and the abundant supply of timber. The forests in the area had once been virtually clear-cut to provide fuel for those furnaces, some of which would consume 750 acres worth of timber in a single year. By those standards, Catherine Furnace was modest. It consumed perhaps 100 acres worth of timber per year. It produced approximately two tons of processed iron for every acre of timber it burned. The furnace property included 4,648 adjacent acres. Although fighting swirled around the furnace complex on May 2nd, a story, probably apocryphal, from a local family, tells of the wife of a Confederate soldier who sought shelter at the furnace because she was going into labor just as the battle was getting underway. A Confederate lieutenant, John Morgan, discovered the woman and her sensitive condition and realized that she was physically unable to evacuate with the area's other civilians. Morgan assigned six of his patrol to circle the house continuously with white flags until the battle was over. Although the actual identity of the lieutenant has never been confirmed, two likely candidates exist. John G. Morgan of the 45th Georgia Infantry, or J. D. Morgan, a surgeon with the 23rd Georgia, both of whom came from regiments posted at or near the furnace. In any event, as the story goes, the woman honored the officer by naming her baby Morgan Lieutenant Monroe. After the Battle of Chancellorsville, the armies passed out of the area for a time, but in May of 1864, Brigadier General George Armstrong Custer and his cavalry paid a visit to the furnace. The cavalry destroyed it, but the Welfords quickly had their operation up and running again, and they continued to process iron for the Confederate war effort until the end of the war. With its biggest customer gone, Catherine Furnace ceased operations shortly thereafter, marking the end of an era. Chapter 8 Withdrawals, May 2, 1863 As Jackson's long line of butternut soldiers moved past the Welford house, the Welfords, too, were moving, loading their belongings into carts and wagons in preparation for a quick escape. Near the head of the column marched young Charles Welford, who, at the behest of his father, had agreed to serve as guide for the army. Treb Stewart had made his headquarters in the family's yard the day before, and knew the family could provide crucial intelligence. Stewart's men had not been the first to visit the family, though. On April 30th, Federal soldiers on a foraging mission had swept across the Welford's property. The Yankees were down at the furnace not a mile from us. Indeed, all around they were shouting and shooting, wrote Evelina Welford, the elder Charles's niece, in a letter to her sister. And we four unprotected females every moment expecting their appearance at the house. As soon as they came so near, Uncle, Charles, and Charlie made their escape into the woods, as they certainly would have been captured had they remained. About twenty Federals finally dropped in, searching the house for arms and Confederates, shooting the fowls and stealing provisions, of which we had a scant supply, Evelina said, conceding that they generally behaved very well. They seemed confident of success. Of course, we were amused at their boasting, she wrote. As the Federals left and Stuart first arrived, a late-night skirmish resulted in a single casualty, Major Channing Price from Richmond, who was brought back to the Welford House, where he died overnight. Now, two days later, with twenty-eight thousand soldiers marching past the house, more turmoil was brewing. In expectation of some trouble, the carts were waiting at the door, Evelina recalled, and our trunks and some other valuables being put in and sent off, we hurriedly took our departure for the woods, making as good time as you might imagine under the circumstances. As the Welfords made their departure, Federal artillery set up near the furnace. The shells came whizzing by, bursting apparently near us, Evelina wrote, and you may judge that our feelings were not of the most comfortable kind. Off they fled into a strange woody country, perfectly ignorant of where the path we were taking would lead us to. Even as the Welfords were leaving, the Federal Army was advancing down the road, with members of the 23rd Georgia, flushed out of their cover at the Catherine Furnace, 
trying to stave them off. Under heavy pressure, the Georgians fell back all the way to an unfinished railroad cut that lined the north edge of the Welford farm. There they fended off the Federal troops, but the weight of numbers was against them. Union sharpshooters worked their way around to the right flank of the Georgians' positions and hit them as they were pinned in the cut. The Georgians' colonel, Emery Best, ordered his men to fall back again, but few of his men received the order. Rather than wait to ensure that they obeyed, Best made off to the rear, leaving most of his men behind. Some 269 members of the regiment would end up as prisoners. Best would later be court-martialed for abandoning his men and was drummed out of the army. The Georgians, however, remained defiant, even as prisoners. You may think you have done a big thing just now, but wait till Jackson gets round on your right, one of them boasted. You'll catch hell before night, said another. To staunch the flow of Federal troops into the rear of the column, Jackson dispatched the brigades of Edward Thomas and Thomas J. Archer to thwart any Federal foray. Dan Sickles seemed unconcerned by any of it. While the Welford family had seen trouble marching down the road, the Third Corps commander saw it as something entirely different. I think it is a retreat, he said. Although he'd been ordered not to bring on a general engagement, Sickles was itching for a fight. He ordered more men to move southward from Hazel Grove toward the furnace. He also moved a division into position for support. As the afternoon wore on, Sickles called for still more reinforcements. Closest at hand was Major General Oliver Otis Howard, standing in reserve with his Eleventh Corps. Sickles sent a message to Howard that he was about to make a grand attack, having been for some time driving the enemy, and expected soon a brilliant result, that he desired to place Howard's reinforcement upon his right flank in the forward movement. Howard personally led a division down toward the action, deciding he should be on hand in case things were really as bad as Sickles was making them out to be. The expedition to the Welford Furnace and below is clearly the cause of the failure of the campaign, wrote Dr. Augustus Hamlin, an Eleventh Corps surgeon, who later became one of the earliest historians of the battle. Hooker permitted twenty thousand men to be detached from the entrenched lines of defense and moved forward two or three miles in a dense forest, leaving a gap of three miles between the rest of Howard's Eleventh Corps and the right flank of Sickles's position. That three-mile gap, though no one suspected it at the time, would prove disastrous for the Union Army. At the Welford House site and the unfinished railroad cut. From the parking area, if you walk back down the road one-tenth of a mile, you'll come to the unfinished railroad cut where the Georgians made their last stand. The railroad was cut in the early 1850s as a path linking Fredericksburg to Orange Courthouse but competition from the Orange Plank Road, which runs a nearly parallel route just a few miles to the west, proved to be the railroad's undoing, and the project never saw completion prior to the war. During the 1864 Battle of the Wilderness, James Longstreet would send Confederate soldiers down the railroad cut, just a few miles southwest of here, to spearhead a flank attack on the Union Army near the Brock Road-Plank Road intersection. One of the brigade commanders involved in that attack, Brigadier General William Mahone, had been one of the railroad's initial developers. In the post-war years, the railroad was completed, operating for more than sixty years before going bankrupt for a second time. The tracks were torn up in the late 1930s. Today the cut is still visible, and closer to the city of Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania County even converted part of the line into a bike and walking path. If you walk back to the parking area, a footpath will lead you to the former site of the Welford home. Besides owning Catherine Furnace, the Welfords owned six hundred acres of improved land, and 629 acres of unimproved land. Charles also owned eleven slaves. James Diggs, an overseer, also lived on the property. We lost a great deal by their occupation, but not as much as we expected, Evelina Welford wrote in her letter to her sister. Uncle C. has lost nearly all his clothes, at Mary too, but his books are saved, and the furnace too, so we have still much to be thankful for. A few more such moves by the army, she feared, or just break us up entirely. Families that did not flee as the Welfords did found themselves with unwanted company. The Chancellors, for instance, and the commanding general of the Union Army commandeer their home for his headquarters. Thomas Downer, a farmer who lived with his family in the Hawkins House, near the Wilderness Church, found himself hosting Union Brigadier General Carl Schurz and his staff. While everyone treated each other very kindly and hospitably, Downer's family were essentially captives. Continuing along Jackson Trail East, and later along Jackson Trail West, 
You will see instances where modern development is encroaching on the edges of the battlefield. While the National Park Service owns the road itself and maintains it as a public road, in some places the Park Service's property stretches only ten feet on either side of the road. That's why you'll see some homes built so close to the flank march route. In other places, the Park Service owns more of the land. Chapter 9. Jackson's Flank March May 2, 1863 As the Confederate column reached the intersection with the Brock Road, young Charles Welford led Jackson and his men left, toward the south, away from the Union Army. The terrain of the southward route offered concealment from Federal observers, some of whom were aloft in a hydrogen balloon. Confederates marched over a quick series of rolls and dips in the Brock Road, before coming to a private road that plunged into the thick woods on the right. The column turned onto this new road, its movement hidden from view by the small hills the soldiers had just crossed. But just as the terrain protected the Confederates from view, it also prevented them from seeing much. For hours at a time we neither saw nor heard anything, one marcher wrote. The soldiers didn't know the specifics of their mission, but they sensed that something big was unfolding. Every man in the ranks knew that we were engaged in some great flank movement, said Dr. Hunter Holmes McGuire, Jackson's surgeon, and they eagerly responded and pressed on at a rapid gait. Jackson urged his men to keep up their pace and keep the ranks closed. Regimental commanders were ordered to march at the rear of their regiments to minimize straggling. Strict silence was enforced, the men being allowed to speak only in whispers, one North Carolinian said. The men marched about one mile every twenty-five minutes with a ten-minute break, each hour to rest. For their midday meal break, Jackson allotted them only fifteen minutes, not the normal hour. One artillerist noted how grave and silent Jackson looked. McGuire, too, noticed it. Never will I forget the eagerness and intensity of Jackson on that march to Hooker's rear, McGuire recalled. His face was pale, his eyes flashing. Out from his thin, compressed lips came the terse command, Press forward! Press forward! In his eagerness, as he rode, he leaned over the neck of his horse, as if, in that way, the march might be hurried. On and on he urged them. Press forward, Jackson said. Press forward. The day was very warm, the route poor, wrote Lieutenant Octavius Wiggins of the 37th North Carolina. Wiggins, as a member of Jackson's foot cavalry, had participated in a number of old Jack's famous foot races. This differed from all others I had ever known in severity. On we rushed, jumping bushes, branches, up and down hill. Temperatures climbed into the eighties. McGuire and other medical officers soon found themselves attending to soldiers falling out of line from heat stroke. If the heat bothered Jackson, he never showed it. In fact, he wore a heavy India rubber raincoat over his uniform jacket all day. Although he made no mention of it to anyone, he had caught a chill over the previous few days. Dr. McGuire, off assisting swooning marchers, was too busy to notice. The only thing that might have made the march even more unpleasant would have been dust. Dust on the march choked the man and got in his eyes. Fortunately for Jackson's marchers, recent rain kept the dust down, although it also left mud holes in some of the low spots. It was therefore a welcome sight when the column came down the hill toward Poplar Run. While the column didn't stop, Soldiers were allowed to quench their thirst in the stream as they trod through. They followed the road up and away from the stream, pressing forward, pressing forward. By one thirty in the afternoon, as the tail end of Jackson's column finally filed past Catherine Furness, the head of the column reached Brock Road. By two o'clock, it neared the intersection with the Orange Plank Road. There, Jackson planned to form his twenty-eight thousand men into a line of battle and sweep up the Orange Plank Road and into the Union flank. But Brigadier General Fitzhugh Lee of Stuart's cavalry, and Robert E. Lee's nephew, arrived with news. He invited Jackson to follow him along a narrow pathway through the woods, where they came to a cleared hilltop near a farmhouse. What a sight presented itself before me, Fitz Lee later wrote. Below, and but a few hundred yards distant, ran the Federal line of battle. There were the lines of defense, with abatis in front, and long lines of stacked arms in the rear. Two cannon were visible in that part of the line. The soldiers were in groups in the rear, laughing, chatting, smoking, probably engaged here and there in games of cards and, and other amusements, indulged in, while feeling safe and comfortable, awaiting orders. 
At rear of them were other parties driving up and butchering beeves. The problem, as Fitzley pointed out, was that the Orange Plank Road, which Jackson had originally intended as his avenue of attack, ran straight into the line of Union entrenchments, not into the Union flank. But from his hilltop vantage point, the two men could see the end of the Union line less than a mile or so farther to the west. If Jackson followed the new route, suggested by the cavalrymen, he could still swing his army into the Union flank, with plenty of cover from the wilderness to shield his moves. Stonewall's face bore an expression of intense interest during the five minutes he was on the hill, Fitzley said. The paint of approaching battle was coloring his cheeks, and he was radiant to find no preparation had been made to guard against a flank attack. Jackson rode back to his column and began barking out orders. His lead division must move ahead toward the turnpike. Jackson promised to join them shortly. The Stonewall Brigade, under Brigadier General Frank Paxton, must stay with Fitzley's cavalry along the Orange Plank Road to guard the Confederate flank as it passed by. It was just before 3 p.m., and Jackson penned a quick dispatch to his commander. In four sentences, he reported that his lead division was up and the next two appeared to be well on their way. He also confirmed the position of the Union Army. I hope as soon as practicable to attack, Jackson wrote. I trust that an ever-kind providence will bless us with great success. Along Jackson Trail West The well-graded gravel road you would see today is a far cry from the narrow, primitive path the Confederate column had to follow from much of its way in the spring of 1863. Two cars can pass each other along the road today, but four infantrymen, walking shoulder to shoulder, had just enough space to move. Keep in mind that the ground cover of the forest is much more open now than it was back then, too. Union Major General Oliver Otis Howard, who would be getting a visit from Jackson's men in the very near future, described the wilderness of Spotsylvania County as an area filled with stunted trees, such as scraggy oaks, bushy firs, cedars, and junipers, all entangled with a thick, almost impenetrable undergrowth, and crisscrossed with an abundance of wild vines. That dense underbrush felt like an oppressive wall crowding in on the sides of the road, as vegetation reached into the open space for whatever sunlight it could get. At Poplar Run Poplar Run crossed Jackson Trail West about one mile from where the trail branched away from Brock Road. Today, Poplar Run is little more than a trickle running across some cobblestones. From this location, it flows east. Near the Welford House site, it links with Lewis's Run and flows south to eventually become the Nye River, which in turn flows southeast and joins with several other tributaries to become the Mattapanai River. When rain swept through the region in late April of 1863, rivers and streams rose quickly. They were high enough, for instance, to delay a cavalry raid by Union Brigadier General George Stoneman, who couldn't cross the rain-swollen Rappahannock River. But by May 2nd, water levels had dropped. Poplar Run was easily fordable for Jackson's troops. Today, heavy rainfalls occasionally push Poplar Run's water levels as high as three or four feet. But such occasions are rare. Typically, at its deepest points, the water is usually only shin-deep. From here, as you travel farther along Jackson Trail West, you'll pass a large open farm on the left. In 1863, that area was still thick wilderness. Just on the road on the right, you'll pass a subdivision built in the 1990s. For being a path chosen for its remoteness, the Jackson Trail today continues to become less and less remote in the face of development pressure. Farther down the trail, about nine-tenths of a mile from Poplar Run, you'll see on the left the remains of trench lines that run parallel to the road. Federal soldiers dug these trenches during the Battle of the Wilderness in May 1864. At Reconnaissance Point Reconnaissance Point is about 2.1 miles from Poplar Run. This is the location where Jackson Trail West merges back with Brock Road. Even Jed Hotchkiss, Jackson's cartographer, who had an excellent reputation for his work, understood that the Confederate Army was moving through a poorly mapped area. It wasn't called the Wilderness for nothing. That's why Jackson relied so heavily on local guides like young Charles Welford. He also knew that he might have to adjust his plan on the fly as the situation became clearer. 
It's no surprise, then, that his trip to the hill at the Burton Farm, about a mile and a quarter almost due north, and just slightly east from your current position, led to a quick change in plan. The Union Army had observation points of its own. One such observation point was the Carpenter Homestead, which sat a little less than a mile and a half due northeast of your current position along a road called Brook Road. Brook Road, called Herndon Road today, though it doesn't show up on the Park Service maps, provided an open shot from the Union line almost straight down to Brock Road. Had the Confederate column marched north on the Brock Road, back where Jackson Trail East first intersects it, the column would have marched in plain sight within a thousand yards of the Carpenter Homestead. The more circuitous route kept the Confederates hidden. On the way to Stop 10, the Brock Road intersects with Orange Plank Road. Jackson had originally planned to turn right to the intersection, but after his reconnaissance trip with Fitz Lee, he chose to go straight. A left turn at the intersection would bring you to the spot where Confederate Lieutenant General James Longstreet was accidentally wounded by his own men on May 6, 1864, during the Battle of the Wilderness, one year and four days after Jackson was wounded under similar circumstances less than four miles away. The intersection itself was a key objective of both armies during the fighting that day. Chapter 10. The Attack, May 2, 1863 The march was nearly over, but the race was still on. It was just after five o'clock, and daylight would linger for only a few hours more. Jackson needed to get his attack under way while there was still time to exploit his advantage. Of his twenty-eight thousand men, two-thirds had arrived on the field and gotten into position. The division of Brigadier General Robert Rhodes would lead the attack. His battle line, two men deep, shoulder to shoulder, stretched nearly a mile beyond the orange turnpike in each direction. Rhodes's five brigades, who numbered nearly ten thousand men in all, would use the turnpike as their axis of advance. Lined up two hundred yards behind Rhodes, Brigadier General Raleigh Colston's division would follow as support, nearly eight thousand strong. But the majority of Jackson's third division, his largest, under Major General A. P. Hill, was still on the march. If Jackson waited for them, he'd lose precious daylight. Those men, he decided, would be used to support the advance as they became available. Jackson sent word to his subordinates that they would launch the attack at 5.15 p.m. Once under way, he told them, under no circumstances was there to be any pause in the advance. Easier said than done in the wilderness, with its rolling terrain and dense tangle of underbrush. While that dense tangle continued to provide cover for the Confederates, even more invaluable to them as protection, was Joe Hooker's continued belief that the Confederate army was in retreat. "'We know that the enemy is fleeing, trying to save his trains,' Hooker said in a telegraph as late as 4.10 that afternoon, when a Union picket sent word up the chain of command that a large body of the enemy is massing in my front, along with the plea, for God's sake, make dispositions to receive them, the report was ignored. If Hooker was erroneous in his assumptions, Eleventh Corps Commander Oliver Otis Howard was downright confused. All day he had received conflicting reports from Union headquarters about what was expected of him. During a personal inspection of the Eleventh Corps line, Hooker had lauded Howard's troops and their dispositions, although he also asked Howard to move some men to protect his right flank. Howard complied, turning elements of three regiments under Colonel Leopold von Gilza to face west. He also turned the guns of Captain Julius Diekman's 13th New York Light Artillery, as well as the guns of his reserve artillery, to face westward as well. This was all the protection the Federal right flank had. Later, Hooker sent word to Howard that the Confederates were retreating, and Hooker ordered Howard to send reinforcements to help Sickles nab the retreating Confederates at Catherine Furness. Howard complied by sending the brigade of Brigadier General Francis C. Barlow to the Furness sector. With little happening on his front, the aloof Howard decided to tag along with Barlow's brigade. Thus, the Eleventh Corps was left without one of its reserve brigades and its corps commander. To make matters worse, Barlow's shift southward left a nearly two-mile gap between the Eleventh Corps and the rest of the Union Army, because Sickles's corps was still at the furnace in Hazel Grove. Howard, like all other corps commanders, had received orders to replenish your supplies of forage, provisions, and ammunition to be ready to start at an early hour tomorrow. Sickles could bag what he could, but Hooker planned an earnest chase after the retreating Confederates tomorrow, 
after he had crushed the Confederate rear guard, Lee's men, demonstrating on his eastern front today. I was deceived at the time of Jackson's attack, Howard later admitted, and did believe, with all the other officers, that he was making for Orange Courthouse. Not everyone in the Eleventh Corps was so sure. Some troops began to get edgy. Most of their commanders urged them not to get so worked up. It was probably just a few bushwhackers moving around out in the forest, they said. The division that held the right flank of both the Eleventh Corps and Hooker's army was commanded by Brigadier General Charles Devens. The Bay State General loathed many of his subordinates, who were predominantly of German descent, so he did not heed the warnings from his officers that a Confederate assault was afoot. Devens had mixed his prejudice with alcohol. Earlier in the day, while riding his horse, Devens somehow ran his leg into a tree. To cope with the pain, he turned to the bottle. By the time Jackson was ready for his assault, Devens was half in the bag. Nevertheless, some of the Eleventh Corps officers quietly began to shift their men around to face not south but west, ignoring the chain of command. Some of us will not see another sunrise, predicted one Ohio colonel. Among soldiers in both armies, tension and anticipation grew as thick as the wilderness itself, yet Jackson himself betrayed no such feelings. There sat General Jackson on Little Sorrel, as calm as if sitting upon a seashore a thousand miles from the battlefield, observed one officer. At five-fifteen, Jackson turned to his lead division commander. Are your men ready, General Rhodes? Yes, sir. You may go forward, then. In my youth, wrote Howard years after the battle, my brother and I had a favorite spot in an upper field of my father's farm from which we were accustomed, after the first symptoms of a coming storm, to watch the operations of the contending winds the sudden gusts and whirlwinds, the sidling swallows excitedly seeking shelter, the swift and swifter black and blacker clouds ever rising higher and pushing their angry fronts toward us. As we listened, we heard the low rumbling from afar. As the storm came nearer, the woods bent forward and shook fiercely their thick branches. The lightning zigzagged in flashes, and the deep-based thunder echoed more loudly, till there was scarcely an interval between its ominous crashing discharges. In some such manner came on that battlefield of May 2nd. Its first lively effects, like a cloud of dust driven before a coming shower, appeared in the startled rabbits, squirrels, quail, and other game flying wildly hither and thither in evident terror, and escaping, where possible, into adjacent clearings. Most Union soldiers had been settling down to cook dinner, with their arms stacked. The unexpected bounty of game that came bounding out of the woods seemed a pleasant surprise, until the rebel yell erupted. And so it was that Howard's Eleventh Corps was largely unprepared for the Confederate juggernaut that swept out of the woods and into the Union Army's exposed right flank. Jackson was on us, said one Union soldier, and fear was on us. It was a terrible gale, Howard wrote. The rush, the rattle, the quick lightning from a hundred points at once, the roar redoubled by echoes through the forest. More quickly than it could be told, with all the fury of the wildest hailstorm, everything, every sort of organization that lay in the path of the mad current of panic-stricken men had to give way and be broken into fragments. They did run, and make no mistake about it, recalled a North Carolina officer. But I will never blame them. I would have done the same thing, and so would you, and I reckon the devil himself would have run with Jackson in his rear. A few Union cannon that had been pointed westward offered little help in stemming the Confederate tide, mostly because their infantry support abandoned them. Farther back, reserve cannon were blocked out of the fight because the fleeing mass of soldiers blocked their line of fire. Howard was making his way back to the front when a sea of blue rushed towards him. On horseback, the one-armed Howard grabbed a U.S. flag and tried to rally his troops. Several units answered his call. The first line of Federal defense near the Wilderness Church quickly collapsed, but but Colonel Adolphus Bushbeck's brigade, including the 154th New York, set up a second line of defense a few hundred yards to the east. The five thousand or so men in this line held on for perhaps twenty minutes, before the full brunt of Jackson's attack overwhelmed them. The gray line moved on regularly with a whoop and yell and rattle of musketry, boasted Henry Kidd Douglas, the youngest member of Jackson's staff. There was, there could be, no effective attempt at resistance. Because Sickles had relocated the bulk of his Third Corps to the south for his sparring match 
near Catherine Furness, Howard's men were separated from the rest of the Federal army with no one to back them up. The Confederates, therefore, had plenty of room to simply keep pushing the Federals. Despite the cacophony of the Eleventh Corps' collapse, no one at Federal headquarters two miles to the east heard a thing. The first indication of the disaster came when a flood of fugitives suddenly streamed past the Chancellor Mansion. Some of the fleeing soldiers continued down the turnpike, through the lines of the Union Second and Twelfth Corps on the far side, where they were captured by Confederates in McLaw's division. Union artillerist Thomas Osborne hoped that such a sight may never again be seen in the Federal Army of the United States. Aghast and terror-stricken, heads bare and panting for breath, they pleaded like infants at the mother's breast that we should let them pass unhindered. Hooker snapped into action. To stem the tide and prevent the panic from spreading, he ordered the men of the Twelfth Corps to shoot anyone else who tried to flee. Second Corps Division Commander Winfield Scott Hancock took the horse and used a flurry of curses and the flat of his sword to smack men back into order. Hooker also ordered a military band, positioned nearby, to begin playing inspirational music. He called down to the Catherine Furnace and ordered Sickles back into the main Federal battle line along the turnpike. Hooker then repositioned the reserve artillery around the Chancellor House so that it aimed westward to meet the oncoming Confederate horde, and he manned one of the guns himself to lead by example. He told the infantry, stationed nearby, to get ready to throw themselves into the breach. Receive the enemy on your bayonets, he ordered. Jackson, meanwhile, continued to urge his men on. Press forward, press forward. But the wilderness itself made that harder and harder to do. Some Confederate units, meeting less resistance from Federal defenders, and having an easier time moving through the brush, advanced farther than others. Some units, advancing straight forward while others had to follow the rolls and swales of the land, advanced more rapidly than others. Units got confused, entangled, or disoriented. Twilight settled in. The thick shadows in the woods deepened. The full moon just peeked over the treetops. One general said it cast just enough of its light to make darkness visible. Jackson's advance stalled. He called back for A.P. Hill, whose troops had brought up the rear of the march and were now available as reserves. Jackson planned to resume the attack as soon as his men were reorganized and Hill's reserves ready. To get a clearer sense of the tactical situation, he and his staff rode ahead of the main line to do some reconnaissance. His trip, which would take him down the mountain road, would prove more fateful than he would have ever imagined. At Jackson's Flank Attack It might be hard to imagine how long Jackson's battle line was when the Confederates got into position, and the restricted view on the battlefields makes it tough to see. If you stand near the cluster of signs and look to the north, you'll see a line of trees a couple of hundred yards away. If you look to the south, past Route 3, you can see more trees. But if you lined up the Confederates along Route 3 at the end of the driveway you just followed, the line would stretch east almost to the visitor center. Lined up perpendicular to the road, the line would have stretched a mile to the south of the road and a mile to the north of the road. Two miles of Confederates in line of battle, two rows deep. It's also tough to imagine the difficulty of the terrain they had to traverse. The open fields today do let you see how uneven the rolling ground is, but you have to add to that the thick undergrowth the soldiers had to pass through. Pushing forward shoulder to shoulder with your rifle out in front of you was even tougher. One Federal soldier said that, even at the brightest point of the day, the sun did not penetrate some areas of the forest because the foliage was so thick. A number of small streams, hardly enough to make the ground soggy, also crisscrossed the area. On your way down the driveway, you crossed one such wet spot. The dense forest and its undergrowth helped to sap the momentum of Jackson's first two divisions. So did the crumbling Union army. To take prisoners or to keep up with a fleeing enemy, Southern soldiers were forced to break from their traditional battle line. Because many of the Union soldiers had been eating or preparing dinner at the time of the attack, some famished Confederates lost momentum because they nabbed pot and pans, ate, shouted, and rushed on. To the west, you can see a clearly defined hill crest where three of the four Federal units in von Gilza's 11th Corps Brigade positioned themselves to face a possible flanking attack. While it's a strong position, it's not very big, and the number of Union units stationed there and facing west were easily overwhelmed by the advancing Confederate wave. 
As you head back east on Route 3, you would follow the same route the Confederates followed as they drove the Federal Army back on its heels. One of the myths of Chancellorsville is that the Eleventh Corps completely broke and ran. But that's not entirely true. That perception came about because, as one historian noted, for each story of resistance and controlled withdrawal, there was another story or two or three stories of utter demoralization and uncontrollable panic. Another reason the Eleventh Corps was so maligned had much to do with xenophobia within the Union Army itself. Many of the units in the Eleventh Corps were composed of recently emigrated Germans, many so new to America that they spoke only a smattering of English. Even on their best days, the Germans of the Eleventh Corps faced discrimination and derision from soldiers in other parts of the army. On May 2nd, when the Corps collapsed under pressure of Jackson's onslaught, many non German soldiers assumed the Flying Dutchman had turned tail and run simply because they were German. Howard, for his part, later admitted, I wanted to die, because of the disaster that had befallen his corps. He lost some 2,400 men out of his total force of about 11,000, just under a quarter of his forces. 1,000 of them, caught off guard by the suddenness of the attack, had been taken prisoner. In comparison, Jackson lost about 800 men. Continuing eastward, he would pass the Wilderness Church, originally built circa 1853, under the supervision of the Reverend Melty S. Chancellor for his Baptist congregation, the wooden church stood two and a half stories tall. Little Wilderness Church looks deserted and out of place, said a Union soldier who camped nearby on May 2nd. Little did its worshippers on last Sabbath day imagine what a conflict would rage about its walls before they again could meet within its peaceful precincts. The current church dates from 1899. Eagle also pass, about 1.1 miles from here on the right, a crescent-shaped monument for the 154th New York Infantry. When Colonel Adolphus Bushbeck tried to set up the second line of defense, some 5,000 men rallied to his call. The 154th New York served as the centerpiece for that rally. The regiment's monument, dedicated in 1996, gets its shape from the insignia of the 11th Corps. Beyond the 154th's monument, 1.8 miles down the road, a private resort sits on the right. That's the location where, as told in the prologue, the 8th Pennsylvania Cavalry suddenly found itself trapped and had to fight its way to safety. Chronologically, the story of Jackson's wounding, told in the prologue, takes place at this point. Chapter 11 The Key to the Battlefield May 3, 1863 the wilderness played no favorites in its ability to bedevil the two armies. Even as Stonewall Jackson, trying to coordinate a night attack, was coming to personal grief along the mountain road, a mile to the south, Dan Sickles was plotting a night attack of his own. The Third Corps commander's aggressiveness that afternoon had put him in an exposed position near Catherine Furness, and the onset of darkness made him realize how vulnerable he was. By 9 p.m., he carefully withdrew his men northward again, to the high ground of Hazel Grove. Not content to simply wait out the night and see what the morning would bring, Sickles wanted to drive northward toward the Orange Turnpike and see if he could catch any Confederates in the dark. Federal soldiers later dubbed this action Sickles's Midnight Charge. Somewhere about ten o'clock, a staff officer came from Sickles' headquarters with information that he had reached the open hill seen to the left front, about four hundred yards across the ravine before Fairview, with Whipple's and Barney's divisions, wrote Twelfth Corps Division Commander Alpheus Williams, and that he should attack the enemy's right flank during the night with at least one brigade. I dispatched messengers to my infantry line that such an attack might take place, and cautioned commanders to hold their fire. It was lucky indeed, for scarcely could the staff officer have got back to his general before the tumult began. What Sickles found instead, said one officer, was a fine description of pandemonium. There was a faint, misty moon, just enough of its light to make darkness visible, Williams described. A tremendous roll of infantry fire, mingled with the yellings and shoutings almost diabolical and infernal, opened the conflict. As his men advanced northward from Hazel Grove, many lost their bearings in the woods. Nervous soldiers soon started shooting at shadows, and the shadows shot back. Confederates started shooting, too. Federal artillery at the Chancellor House soon opened up on the melee. Sickles' men attempted to escape the fusillade, but 
then blundered into soldiers from the Union Twelfth Corps under Major General Henry Slocum. Although the Twelfth Corps had been warned to expect friendly soldiers moving across their front, they returned to fire when Sickles's men fired on them first. About midnight, Burney's division of Sickles' corps made a grand moonlight charge upon the enemy, the historian of the 13th New Jersey penned after the war. It was this engagement that startled us as we lay in the edge of woods, and in some manner, still unexplained to me, we became inextricably mixed up with them. Regiments from half a dozen states were broken up, and became mixed with our brigade. For a time there was dire confusion. Excited aides and orderlies were moving hither and thither with contradictory orders. The Thirteenth Regiment was thrown into confusion, and it was nearly an hour before the line was reformed. Sickles finally managed to pull his men back, and the pandemonium ceased. Nearly two hundred casualties resulted, mostly from friendly fire. Whoever took part in the fizzle in the woods, wrote one soldier, will remember it as long as they live. The Third Corps hunkered down on Hazel Grove to wait for morning after all. On the Confederate side, Jeb Stuart was trying to figure out how to run an infantry corps. He'd commanded infantry only once before, in 1861, and on a far smaller scale, at the Battle of Drainsville. Now he suddenly found himself in command of the entire Second Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. A. P. Hill, who had assumed command of the corps following Jackson's wounding, took a shell fragment across the backs of both his legs, moments after Jackson had been evacuated from the field. Hill sent word to Stuart, the only major general left with the Confederate Second Corps, to take over because the corps' other two division commanders, Rhodes and Colston, were far too inexperienced. Stuart got word of his new assignment at around midnight, while leading a hit-and-run mission against a recently returned Federal Cavalry Division at Ely's Ford. Stuart quickly wheeled around and headed to the front line. In the meantime, the flank attack had come to a standstill. Stuart, when he arrived on the scene, chose not to jump-start things. He let the men of the Second Corps rest while he sent word to Jackson, asking if the wounded general had any instructions. Too weakened by his ordeal, Jackson could only reply, Tell General Stuart he must do what he thinks best. Stuart agreed to press the pursuit already so gloriously begun, but, in truth, he found himself in a very vulnerable position. The flank attack had been a tremendous success, but now, with momentum gone, the situation was far more precarious. The Confederate army was divided, with the bulk of the Federal army sitting between the two halves. If Joe Hooker grasped the reality of the situation, he could destroy Lee's army in three separate pieces where they stood. West of the crossroads, east of the crossroads, and the rear guard at Fredericksburg. Lee, at his headquarters, immediately recognized the peril of his army, and drafted orders for Stuart to do everything possible to reunite the wings of the army, offering assurances that he would do the same. It is necessary that the glorious victory thus far achieved be prosecuted with utmost vigor, and the enemy given no time to rally, Lee added. Stuart, showing Jackson-like resolve coupled with his own trademark flair, never seemed to hesitate or to doubt for one moment that he could just crash his way wherever he chose to strike, a Confederate officer said. Stuart began his preparations. The crashing would start at dawn. Even as Stuart made his preparations to launch the Second Corps against the Federal position, Union Commander Joe Hooker paid a pre-dawn visit to Dan Sickles at Hazel Grove. Hazel Grove, Hooker explained to Sickles, formed a salient in the Union line, an exposed position that jutted outward in a way that made it vulnerable to attack from multiple sides at once. With Lee's armies positioned on either side of the salient, Sickles could expect irresistible pressure, Hooker believed. Sickles disagreed. Hazel Grove was the best high ground in the area, and Sickles was certain he could defend it. Hooker remained unconvinced. If anything went awry, the Third Corps would be cut off from the rest of the Union Army. Hooker had already suffered one tobacco with the Eleventh Corps. Wanting to prevent another, he ordered Sickles to withdraw to a newly established line at Fairview, closer to the Chancellor House. The new line would be more defensible, Hooker maintained, and it would be closer to Hooker's reserves. And so Sickles began his withdrawal, although the wet area around Lewis's run caused a delay. That left the final elements of his artillery and infantry on Hazel Grove as daylight broke, and Jeb Stuart gave the go-ahead for his morning assault. Even as the last of Sickles's men withdrew from the hilltop, the lead elements of Stuart's attack appeared on the edge of the clearing. "'Fix bayonet!' 
their commander, Brigadier General James J. Archer, called. Charge em, boys! Confederate artillerist Porter Alexander set up a pair of batteries to support the charge. Brigadier General Charles K. Graham covered the Federal withdrawal, along with support from the guns of Captain James Huntington's 1st Ohio Light Artillery Battery. He blasted the rebels with canister, and when the canister ran out, his men began firing what is known as rotten shot. They pulled the fuses from the case shot. When the guns were discharged, the fire from the powder ignited the shells, which then burst, hopefully, at the muzzle of the gun. Mounting Confederate pressure, though, forced the Federals to turn their orderly withdrawal into a hasty retreat. Huntington lost three of his guns as he attempted to cross Scott's run during the withdrawal to Fairview. Most importantly, the Federal disappearance offered Confederates open access to Hazel Grove. Like Jeb Stuart, Alexander found himself thrust into command the previous night, replacing the Second Corps wounded chief artillerist Stapleton Crutchfield. Alexander, who was actually part of Longstreet's Corps, knew nothing about the ground, the artillery positions, or the location of the Union batteries. He had spent the night giving himself a crash course on the tactical situation. And now, Joe Hooker had just given him the best artillery spot on the battlefield. There has rarely been a more gratuitous gift of a battlefield, Alexander later wrote. A glorious day, Colonel, a glorious day, rejoiced Captain William Pegram. Alexander had his guns close at hand and ready to go, twenty-eight cannon in all, including the three just captured from Sickles's retreating artillerymen. He also ordered another fourteen guns, up along the plank road, to create converging fire on the new Federal position. It was done very quickly, Alexander wrote. He had to move with speed. Just over half a mile away in Fairview, the Federals were lining up guns of their own. At Hazel Grove It's difficult today to get a sense of just how ideal the hilltop at Hazel Grove was as an artillery platform. In the seventy-square-mile sea of trees that made up the wilderness, there were few open plots of ground, making the wilderness a terrible place to deploy artillery. Open ground like Hazel Grove, which, in 1863, was entirely cleared of trees, was invaluable. Hazel Grove was also ideal because of its elevation. Being on higher ground increases a gun's range, while also making the gun harder to hit with counter-battery fire. Compared to Fairview, two-thirds of a mile to the northeast, Hazel Grub does not have a particular advantage in elevation, but compared to the ground around the Chancellorsville intersection, it does. That's what made this position so important for the Confederates. The viewshed today provides a glimpse of the wide-open alley of fire toward the intersection that the Confederates enjoyed. The artillery pieces you see on the hill represent only a small fraction of the Confederate guns posted here on the morning of May 3rd. Two of the pieces are twelve-pounder Napoleons, originally designed for French Emperor Napoleon III. Napoleons became the most common artillery piece favored by both armies because they were relatively light to transport, yet they had a maximum range of up to seventeen hundred yards. Napoleons fired a twelve-pound solid shot, which is where the term twelve-pounder comes from, explosive shell, case shot, or canister. Also on display is a false Napoleon, a six-pounder gun remodeled after the war to resemble a twelve-pounder Napoleon. This was a relatively common practice used in the early days of battlefield commemoration. Historians typically used false Napoleons to stand in for real ones, in places where there weren't enough actual Napoleons to go around. The fourth gun on display is a twelve-pounder field howitzer. Howitzers fired rounds along a trajectory that arced higher but went less distance than a regular cannon. They were ideal for shooting over obstructions, like breastworks. Union gunners had set up on this position on April 30th, and on May 1st, they fired on Confederates, trying to work their way around the right flank of the Union Army. The same artillerists also opened fire on Stonewall Jackson's column, as it undertook its flank march on May 2nd. The gap in the trees, visible at stop six, which revealed the column's position to the Union gunners, is no longer visible, because the forest is now older and taller. At the time of the battle, a one-and-a-half-story wooden building sat at Hazel Grove built between 1837 and 1838 by Melzi Chancellor, who lived at Dowdo's Tavern to the west, the building may have served as a home for one or all of seven of the slaves Chancellor owned. Several dependencies, including a spring house and a log stable or barn, also sat on the site, as did a small orchard beyond the crest of the hill. When Confederates launched the flank attack, the buildings at Hazel Grove served as hospitals, 
There was an old stable, into which many of the wounded had been carried, and from which, throughout the night, commingled moans and groans of the wounded and dying, wrote a soldier from the Twelfth New Hampshire. The piteous, heart-piercing cries of one poor fellow, continuing until the angel of death heard and came to his relief. The barn survived the battle, as did the spring-house, but the main house did not. By early on May 3rd, fighting had destroyed it. Between 1866 and 1868, the remains of seventy-five Union soldiers buried between this vicinity were disinterred and moved to the National Cemetery at Fredericksburg. Today, the Hazel Grove clearing is smaller than it was in 1863. The open ground would have been extended farther to the west, where a modern tree line hides a timeshare development, the Wilderness Presidential Resort. Chapter 12 The Crucible of Battle, May 3, 1863 even as James Archer's brigade swept onto the crest of the recently abandoned Hazel Grove, the rest of the Confederate Second Corps surged forward. Confederate brigades swept southeasterly through the woods, while others drove straight down the plank road towards the Chancellorsville crossroads. James Lane's brigade, including the 18th North Carolina, was at the forefront of the fray. Remember Jackson, some of them cried, while others let loose the rebel yarrow. Waiting to meet the Confederates were elements of the Union Third and Twelfth Corps, some of them tucked behind low breastworks they had constructed during the night. The Confederates swept into the Union line, and, according to one Union soldier, a long, fierce, and desperate contest ensued. There was, he said, no stopping, no breathing space. Major General Hiram Barry, a native of Maine who commanded a division in the Third Corps, was shot as he crossed the plank road. I am dying he told his staff when they came to his aid, carry me to the rear. By the time they reached the Chancellor House, Barry was dead. Hooker, when he saw Barry's body, was taken aback. My God, Barry, why did this have to happen? Hooker exclaimed, why does the man I relied on so have to be taken away in this manner? As the terrible back and forth continued, Twelfth Corps Chief of Artillery Captain Claremont Best put his forty-four guns into action at Fairview. He had only a slight advantage in numbers over the Confederate artillery, but several disadvantages weighed against him. The first was converging fire. Confederates from multiple positions concentrated their artillery on his single position. Alexander's guns at Hazel Grove, coupled with Lee's guns along modern-day McLaws Drive, rained down a high-density field of fire among the Yankee soldiers. The rebels pour their shot and shell into our midst, a member of the 3rd Michigan recalled, and many a poor fellow rolls over without a groan. Complicating matters, Best had to fire over the heads of his own men, never an ideal option, since it was tremendously demoralizing, not to mention devastating, whenever a shell accidentally burst prematurely and killed members of the artillerists' own army. The noise was deafening as the shells went howling and singing over our heads, and we nervously ducked as they went by, wrote Rice Bull of the 123rd New York Infantry. Bull's regiment was locked in struggle with some of Lane's North Carolinians. Robert Crookshank, also of the 123rd New York, wrote of the oncoming Confederate attacks. They appeared in one solid mass of living gray. The whole woods in front of us seemed to be full of them. Confederates would surge forward, only to be driven back. It would only be for a moment, as the empty places in the enemy's ranks would be filled and on they would come again, he added. As Stuart fed fresh troops into the fight, Hooker ordered a counterattack. Men under Major General William Blinky French's Second Corps Division swept out of their entrenchments in a northwesterly direction, pushing back the disorganized Confederate hordes that had gained so much hard-fought ground that morning. The rebels ran like a plague had fallen among them, a Union officer wrote. The attack bogged down just north of the Plank Road. The country is the worst possible for aggressive warfare, one soldier complained. It is heavily wooded and is very broken. We cannot see a hundred yards in front of us. Another soldier saw that terrain as an advantage. I presume the thick woods protected us, as nearly every tree had a ball in it. To the south of the plank road, a back-and-forth struggle continued. Union and Confederate soldiers charged and countercharged between two sets of earthworks. The colonel of the 18th North Carolina, Thomas J. Purdy, suffered a mortal wound. Their lieutenant colonel, Forney George was knocked out of action, and their color-bearer, who was killed, lost the regimental colors. 
By the end of the war, the unlucky men of the 18th North Carolina not only held the dubious honor of wounding Stonewall Jackson, they also suffered the humiliation of losing three sets of colors. Lane's brigade as a whole lost 910 men killed, wounded, or missing, including the loss of 12 of its 13 field officers. In another charge, members of the Stonewall Brigade claimed that they could show their fellow Confederates how to clear away a federal line. Their commander, Frank Paxton, a hometown friend of Stonewall Jackson's from Lexington, Virginia, was shot through the heart as he led the advance. Although mortally wounded in the chest, Paxton begged one of his officers to bind his arm. He was not shot in the arm, but through the heart, a puzzled subordinate recalled. Without their commander, the brigade shortly thereafter fell back, having failed to clear the Federals. Their reckoning was not accurate, a South Carolinian quipped with dark humor. The cannonade from Fairview also continued to have its effect. The 10th Virginia Infantry, attacking north of the Plank Road, lost a colonel and a major to the artillery fire coming from the south of them. I was shot in the foot, wrote one of the regiment's captains, and in fifteen minutes after I was shot through the hip, which near disabled me. The tide of battle swept past him, and he prepared to surrender, but then it swept back in the other direction, giving him the chance to make an escape. He was hit then a third time, but managed to exit from the field by the assistance of a friend. Brigadier General Samuel McGowan's South Carolina Brigade carried five regiments into the fray. McGowan was hit moments after entering the battle. His second-in-command was wounded a few minutes later, and then his third-in-command was mortally wounded. The next commander in line lost his nerve and had to be relieved. Command finally devolved to Colonel Abner Perrin of the 14th South Carolina, the fifth commander of the brigade, and it had only been engaged for fifteen minutes. Carnage is fearful, telegraphed a Union officer. The brigade of Brigadier General John R. Jones had seen enough action that many of the men and officers in the brigade refused to go over the top again, and it was only 8.30 a.m. Stuart threw in his last line, the division of Robert Rhodes, at around 9 a.m. The push was enough to finally dislodge the Union Army from its breastworks south of the Plank Road, which suddenly put the Confederates in a position to threaten the Union artillery position at Fairview. Pushing to the front was the steady North Carolina brigade of Brigadier General Stephen Ramseur. Ramseur's brigade had seen relatively light action on May 2nd, boxed out of the fight by another southern brigade. On the morning of May 3rd, the men came up behind Warren's men who refused to make way. The Tar Heels literally walked over their comrades. I myself put my foot on the back and head of an officer of high rank in mounting the work, admitted Colonel Brian Grimes of the 4th North Carolina, and through very spite ground his face in the earth. A voice bellowed at Grimes ominously, You may double-quick over, but you'll come back faster than you go. First Lieutenant William C. Brewer of 2nd North Carolina was inspired by the bravery he witnessed on the field. I never shall forget the scene when General Ramseur took a position in front of his brigade, drew his sword, waved it over his head, and cried out, Men, will you follow me? Every man arose at the sound of his voice. Then the command, Forward, charge! The only charge on the enemy they ever made without the yell, silent as specters. Every man in the brigade knew we were being sacrificed. A look of grim determination to their duty was on every face. A member of the 7th New Jersey described the Confederate advance. When the front line of Ramsur's brigade reached our breastworks, the men dropped upon their knees and began firing upon the fugitives. It was about 150 yards from where the 7th was in line to the plank road at the breastworks. This was the mistake of Ramsur's men. A halt caused the rear ranks to close up in a solid mass, and every shell from our thirty-six guns, which were fired point-blank as fast as they could be loaded, caused a frightful slaughter, and for a few moments we stood and watched the fearful sight. It was a costly push. Amser's brigade, which led the final assault, successfully led the punch through the Federal line, but, in doing so, lost more than half of its strength. The 4th North Carolina alone suffered a casualty rate of nearly eighty per cent. The brigade as a whole lost seven hundred eighty-nine of the fifteen hundred nine men who entered the fray. Ram Sir, seeing the carnage that befell his men, wept like a child. According to one Georgian, the Federal artillerists, in Fairview, threw grape, 
canister bombs, balls, and nearly everything else, at the Confederates threatening their position. That firepower kept the Confederates at bay, for the moment. To the southeast, Robert E. Lee, acting in the capacity of a corps commander, ordered the divisions of Anderson and McLaws to begin attacking. Anderson's division put pressure on Fairview from a new direction, making the position even more difficult to maintain. A series of charges and countercharges turned the field into chaos. Every time the Confederate infantry would pull back, said one Union soldier, Confederate artillerists on Hazel Grove poured the shells over into us in perfect showers. But that wasn't all. As more Confederate batteries rolled into position on Hazel Grove, some of them began to take aim at Joseph Hooker himself. At Fairview In the open fields surrounding Fairview are low, crisscrossing mounds of earth called lunettes. The word means half-moon, which describes their shape. These lunettes surrounded and protected some of the thirty-four artillery pieces that dominated Fairview Heights. Today they remain as silent witnesses to the battle. We ask visitors to please refrain from walking on them or on other fortifications. The Union artillerymen who dug these lunettes initially faced their line to the south. As the battle raged and Jackson launched his flank attack, many of the artillery pieces were turned to face to the west. The lunettes were re-dug to face west as well. Looking southwest, the guns atop these heights had a good field of fire toward Hazel Grove, where thirty Confederate cannon were perched. The narrow vista between the two farms witnessed heavy artillery fire along with some of the bloodiest infantry fighting of the war. Fairview, which appeared in many soldier letters as the Frame House, the Log Cabin, and the Overseer's House, was a one-and-a-half-story log cabin built circa 1809. Owned by Anne and Richard Pound, the building originally served as a tavern and inn. The adjacent land also had a cemetery, a well, an orchard, and at least one outbuilding. Following Richard's death, Anne remarried, and in 1816, she and her new husband, George Chancellor, moved into a new home on the other side of the road, closer to the intersection. By the time of the war, the log cabin at Fairview was occupied by James and Roberta Moxley and their children. Moxley was the overseer of the Chancellorsville Plantation, with twenty slaves under his charge. When the Union Army marched into the area on April 29th, the Moxleys fled, first to Catherine Furness, then beyond. The slaves vanished from historical record. The building sustained a few scars during the battle, but it remained standing and sturdy enough to be used as a field hospital after the fight. The old log cabin was the center of our colony, and around it were more than five hundred wounded men, wrote one of the patients. In it were placed those thought to be the most dangerously wounded and most needing surgical treatment. One man was wildly delirious. His end came at night and was tragic. He jumped up and ran and entered the cabin through the front door. On the further side of the room was a large dish shelf about three feet above the floor, on which was a lighted candle. The demented man must have seen the light and started for it, trampling on the wounded men on the way. He laid down on the shelf and died before morning. Although the log cabin was destroyed later in the month, remnants of its stone chimneys still exist. The old well, now capped, is also visible. A low brick wall hems in the Chancellor family cemetery. Twenty-eight monuments mark the graves of various family members, although several individuals are buried in the cemetery without markers. The oldest marker belongs to George Chancellor, 1785 to 1836, the family patriarch. His wife, Anne, 1793 to 1860, was a widow of Captain Richard Pound, the original owner of Fairview, who was interred in the cemetery in one of the unmarked graves. The youngest person in the cemetery is Susie E. Guy, 1863 to 1866, who died on her third birthday, September 29th. The last chancellor buried in the cemetery was Susan Margaret Chancellor, 1847 to 1935. Several of the men interred in the cemetery served with the Confederate Army, and at least two of them died during the war. For more information on the family, see Appendix D. From Fairview, on the way to Stop 12, as you head back down Barry Paxton Drive, You'll pass the 27th Indiana Infantry Regimental Marker, about one-tenth of a mile on your right. The 27th Indiana escaped the worst of the fighting on May 2nd 
even absorbing some soldiers from regiments manhandled by Jackson's attack. When Confederates resumed their attacks on the morning of May 3rd, things got hot for the Indianans. Colonel Silas Colgrove, operating a pair of abandoned cannon he'd pressed into service, shouted to his son, the regiment's major, "'Here, boy, you run the regiment while I run this here gun.' The 27th Indiana, along with the rest of its brigade, repulsed several Confederate charges from the direction of Hazel Grove, withdrawing only because the entire Union position was collapsing. Also on the way to Stop 12, you'll drive down Slocum Drive. There are earthworks along the right side of the road. This line of earthworks marks the position of the 12th Corps on the morning of May 3rd, just before Confederates in Anderson's division began to attack. As you'll remember from Chapter 11, Slocum's 12th Corps saw some strange things on the night of May 2nd, when Dan Sickles' men got lost in the woods as they tried to make their night attack, some of them brushed into men of the 12th Corps stationed along part of this line. Several hours later, when James Archer's Confederates swept over Hazel Grove, they followed the retreating Federals in this direction, but ran into the 12th Corps. After a brief fight, Slocum's men forced the Confederates to withdraw. Chapter 13 Agony and Conflict May 3, 1863 Days earlier, Joe Hooker had proclaimed that his plans were perfect. Now, as he stood on the front porch of the Chancellor House on the morning of May 3rd, those perfect plans were unraveling before his eyes. He'd spent much of the morning riding his lines, urging on his men, keeping up their spirits, showing everyone why he'd earned the nickname Fighting Joe. Union soldiers responded with grim enthusiasm, marching charge with countercharge and going toe-to-toe with the Confederate army in what would become the bloodiest morning of the entire war, and the second bloodiest single day, second only to Antietam. Bullets flew like raindrops in a summer shower, one soldier wrote. Withdrawing the Third Corps from Hazel Grove and into a tighter defensive position had, Hooker thought, been a sound military decision. The position I abandoned was one that I had held at a disadvantage, he would say after the war, as way of explanation. But from the front porch, as Hooker watched Confederate artillery perched on Hazel Grove trade blows with his own artillery at Fairview and in the clearing around the Chancellor House, he began to realize the tide of battle had begun to shift against him. Confederate artillery that would never have otherwise come into play because of the thick woods had a perfect platform from which to bombard the Union position. A courier rode up to Hooker with a dispatch. Just as the general reached for it, a Confederate shell screamed toward them and slammed into the wooden column next to Hooker, sending splinters everywhere. A huge chunk of the column smashed into the general, knocking him to the porch floor, senseless. Witnesses thought Hooker was dead. He lay unconscious for more than half an hour, and even after he revived, he was insensible. At one point, he tried to mount his horse so he could show his troops he was okay but the attempt made him sick. Hooker's doctor convinced the general to lie down on a blanket, and eventually he evacuated the general to the rear, to a position near the Bullock Farm. A few moments after Hooker left, a Confederate shell struck the blanket where the commander had been resting. For the remainder of the day he was wandering, and was unable to get any ideas into his head, wrote a member of Hooker's staff. The doctor declared that Hooker had a severe concussion. He suffered great pain and was in a comatose condition for most of the time, said a Union general. His mind was not clear, and they had to wake him up to communicate with him. Despite his injury, Hooker refused to turn over command to Second Corps Commander Darius Couch, and so, for nearly an hour, as the tide shifted against the Union army, as Stuart and Lee reunited their forces and attacked all along the line, as Union guns withdrew from Fairview because they'd run out of ammunition, the Army of the Potomac suffered from a lack of leadership. As the Union position at Fairview collapsed, Porter Alexander moved several of his artillery pieces forward from Hazel Grove to take up position where the Federal guns had been just moments earlier. We deployed on the plateau and opened on the fugitives, infantry, artillery, wagons, everything, swarming about the Chancellorsville house and down the broad road leading thence to the river, Porter later rose. During the barrage, the Chancellor House caught fire. Members of the Chancellor family and several neighbors, all huddled in the basement, were told by a member of Hooker's staff that they had to flee. Winfield Scott Hancock directed Captain Thomas Henry of the 140th Pennsylvania to assist in the evacuation of the house. 
Henry directed his company into the east wing of the mansion, where they extracted thirty-three wounded soldiers and three women. According to Henry, the three women came out with him, one on each arm, with a third being towed by his coattails. Other fugitives bolted from the house, through the roar of battle, to find safety. The woods around the house were a sheet of fire, the air filled with shot and shell, horses were running, rearing and screaming, the men, a mass of confusion, moaning, cursing, and praying, recalled one of the refugees. Hooker's staff member took them up the road that led first to the Bullock Farm and then beyond to U.S. Ford, where a chaplain then escorted them across the Rappahannock. Tillery came on line in the yard and orchard of Chancellor Home. Captain George F. Lapines, 5th Main Battery E, blasted away at the relentlessly advancing line of Confederates. Lapine went down, as did twenty-seven other gunners. By the end of the fight, there were two gunners at their pieces, John Chase and James LeBroke. A Confederate shell slammed into their gun, silencing it. Hancock ordered infantry to retrieve the cannon. Men of the 53rd, 116th, and 140th Pennsylvania Infantry Regiments pulled the guns off the line. Eventually, the 53rd and 140th turned their haul over to the 116th Pennsylvania of the Irish Brigade, which finished the job. Later, the 116th Pennsylvania erroneously received sole credit for saving the guns in Harper's Weekly. Private John Chase, for his actions, was awarded the Medal of Honor. Major General Darius Couch, Hooker's second in command by virtue of seniority, led the final defense of the Chancellorsville intersection as the Union Army tried to extract itself from the calamity that had befallen it. The Federals fought stubbornly as they fell back to a new line established by Meade's Fifth Corps, with its apex across the road from the Bullock Farm. Meade had urged Hooker to let him wade into the fray with his fresh corps, as well as with the fresh First Corps, nearly thirty thousand troops in all. But Hooker had held them back as insurance to stay any possible rout that might occur. The First and Fifth Corps were Hooker's vast line of defense. Lee, seeing that the Chancellorsville intersection now belonged to Confederate hands, rode down from Hazel Grove. When he arrived at the clearing around the house, his men parted to let him pass. One long unbroken cheer, in which the feeble cry of those who lay helpless on the earth, blended with the strong voices of those who still fought, rose high above the roar of battle and hailed the presence of the victorious chief, wrote one of Lee's aides de camp. Sitting atop his white horse, Traveler, with the Chancellor Mansion engulfed in flames behind him, Lee removed his hat and acknowledged his men. He sat, wrote Lee Staffer, in the full realization of all that soldiers dream of, triumph. At Chancellorsville When the Battle of Chancellorsville opened, the Chancellor family, along with ten other refugees, hid in the basement of the house. Upstairs they were bringing in the wounded, and we could hear their screams of pain, Sue recalled. They had taken our sitting-room as an operating room, and our piano served as an amputating table. Outside the window, doctors had heaped a large pile of limbs they had amputated from their patients, and rows and rows of dead bodies covered with canvas had been lined up nearby. When Confederate shells set the Chancellor home on fire, and the refugees fled from the basement, Sue would forever remember the last look she had of her old home, completely enveloped in flames. The Union officer that led them to safety, Colonel Joseph Dickinson, faced some criticism for his effort, but he would not forsake the civilians. If here is not the post of duty, looking after the safety of those helpless women and children, he told one officer who challenged him, then I don't know what you call duty. Sue Chancellor wrote her account of the battle seventy-two years later, in 1935. The years have dimmed my memory as to incidents and occurrences, she admitted, yet the horrible impression of those days of agony and conflict is still vivid, and I can close my eyes and see again the blazing woods, the house in flames, the flying shot and shell, and the terror-stricken women and children pushing their way over the dead and wounded, led by the courageous and chivalrous Colonel Dickinson. Chapter 14 The Forgotten Front May 3rd and 4th, 1863 To the east, John Sedgwick amassed his wing of Hooker's army at the edge of the city of Fredericksburg. It was 11.30 a.m., and the major fighting at the Chancellorsville crossroads had ceased an hour earlier, 
Cedric was still twelve miles from Hooker's wing and some six hours behind schedule. Late on the evening of May 2nd, Hooker had sent word to Sedgwick, then still south of Fredericksburg, to move with all possible haste to the Army's assistance. Sedgwick received his orders at 10.10 p.m. March his men two miles north into the city of Fredericksburg and strike west for Chancellorsville, taking the Orange Plank Road, modern-day Route 3, to the battlefield. Uncle John, as he was known to his men, was to attack and destroy any force he may fall in with on the road. The route of march laid out by Hooker would force Sedgwick to storm the Gibraltar of the South at Maria's Heights, where Confederates were hunkered down behind the same stone wall that had caused the Union Army so much grief the previous December during the First Battle of Fredericksburg. Once through the Confederate position, Sedgwick would be able to move down the Orange Turnpike for twelve miles and come upon a portion of Lee's army from the rear. Cedric was to do all of this before dawn, because Hooker wanted the men of the Greek cross to approach Lee from the rear. Cedric's twenty-three thousand men would then act as a hammer, and Hooker's salient as the anvil, a reversal of Hooker's original intention. The two forces would use him, Lee, up. Hooker, the ever-daring poker player, used the ace he had in his sleeve, or so he thought. The Herculean task laid at Cedric's feet was too much to handle. Instead of being in position to help Hooker, Cedric was stalled outside Fredericksburg. To clear the way west, Cedric sent two assault columns bounding up William and Hanover streets toward the Confederate lines. Concentrated artillery and small arms fire halted these lances in their tracks. Men fell by the scores. Some wounded men dove into drainage ditches beside the streets, only to drown in what little water lay in them. Then, across the old Maria's Heights killing ground, emerged a diamond-shaped formation of four regiments. Instead of stopping to fire, the regiments simply ran headlong at the Confederates, leaped over the infamous stone wall, and engaged in hand-to-hand combat with the Mississippi soldiers inside the sunken road. By noon, Federal forces had seized Maria's Heights. Lee caught wind of Sedgwick's movements, though, and sent a force out to intercept Major Sedgwick, as Lee referred to him out of habit, from their old acquaintance in the pre-war army. Lee had plenty of time to deal with this new Federal threat, because Hooker had tucked himself behind a sturdy line of earthworks, sprinkled with cannon and manned by the remaining seventy-five thousand effectives he had on hand. There, Hooker waited for his savior, John Sedgwick, and his twenty-three thousand men. The fighting in Fredericksburg also attracted the attention of Confederate Brigadier General Cadmus Wilcox. His Alabama brigade had started the morning at Banks Ford, with little happening there. Wilcox ventured to the sounds of the guns to the east. His brigade missed most of the major fighting, but Old Billy Fixin, as his men called him, set his mind to delaying Sedgwick in any way he could. From 12.30 p.m. until after 3.30 p.m., Sedgwick's slothful advance ground forward, with Wilcox nipping at him the entire way. Wilcox drew a line of battle at a low ridge named Salem Heights, where a small Baptist church sat. His five Alabama regiments steeled themselves for the full force of a federal attack, but then Wilcox received timely reinforcements from Lee, who had again split his army in the face of a superior foe. Sedgwick tried to fight his way through, but ended up withdrawing into a defensive position around Banks's ford. Hooker now had a perfect opportunity to strike out at Lee. Because the Confederate commander had sent reinforcements to Salem Church, Lee had fewer than thirty thousand men at the crossroads. Hooker could have pushed his giant army forward and fallen on a much smaller Confederate force, then pinned the rest of Lee's army against Sedgwick or driven them back into Fredericksburg. But it was not to be. Hooker's wing of the army was held in check by Confederates, akin to a Rottweiler held in a corner by a Chihuahua. Thus, May 4th passed with Sedgwick pinned up around the ford and Hooker hunkered down behind the last line. Lee looked for a way to strike, but neither situation offered a clear opportunity, and so the day passed, as did any chance Lee had for destroying the Federal Army in detail. At Salem Church Salem Church now serves as the poster child for lost opportunities in the ongoing struggle to preserve Civil War battlefields. The church itself, built in 1844 by a Baptist congregation, sits on 2.76 acres of property now owned by the National Park Service. In 1958, the congregation built a new church, which sits on the far side of the adjacent cemetery, 
In 1962, they donated the old church to the National Park Service. At about that time, plans for the new interstate highway, I-95, got underway, triggering population growth and commercial development in the area. When the property around Salem Church came up for sale in 1977, at the price tag of $300,000, the Park Service claimed the price tag was $25,000 too high, and so let the piece slip away. By 1981, a gas station appeared on that ground across from the old church. The swarm of development has gone on unabated in the area ever since. The original church is periodically open to the public, but the grounds are open for visitors to explore. There's a granite marker installed in 1903 by James Power Smith, a former member of Stonewall Jackson's staff, and a large stone and bronze tablet erected by the United Daughters of the Confederacy in 1927, on May 3rd, the 64th anniversary of the battle. The site also includes two monuments erected by veterans from a pair of New Jersey regiments, the 15th and 23rd, on either side of Route 3. The Battle of Second Fredericksburg has a legacy that's even less tangible. The sunken road and stone wall remain, but their role in the Chancellorsville campaign is almost entirely overshadowed by the events there on December 13, 1862. Epilogue, Beyond the Crossroads, May 1863 Two months after the battle, as the story goes, on the way north toward Pennsylvania, a subordinate asked Joe Hooker what went wrong at Chancellorsville. For once I lost confidence in Hooker, Fighting Joe replied, and that is all there is to it. The story, apocryphal as it might be, is as close to an explanation of what happened as history is apt to get. On the night of May 4th, Hooker held the Council of War. A majority of his subordinates argued in favor of launching an offensive, or at least staying in position and inviting Lee to attack. But Hooker overruled them. What was the use of calling us together at this time of night when he intended to retreat anyhow? groused First Corps Commander Major General John Reynolds after the meeting. Hooker withdrew both sections of the Federal Army back across the Rappahannock, his main force, and Sedgwick's force bottled up at Banks Ford. The men were absolutely astonished at our move, said a Wisconsin officer, for everyone felt that we had the best of the Rebs and could hold our position till hell froze over. In its wake, the Union Army left behind about 13% of its men, more than 17,000 killed, wounded, or missing. Hooker's losses included six general officers, including his close friend Hiram Barry. Lee, in contrast, lost about 22% of his men, more than 13,000. During the fight on May 3rd, which turned out to be the second bloodiest day in American history, casualties came at a rate of one man every second for five hours. The losses reached 21,357 on May 3rd alone. My God! My God! exclaimed President Lincoln when he heard about the federal casualties. What will the country say? Hooker tried to put his own spin on what had occurred. Events of the last week may swell with pride the heart of every officer and soldier in the army, read Hooker's General Order No. 49. We have made long marches, crossed rivers, surprised the enemy in his entrenchments, and whenever we have fought, we have inflicted heavier blows than those we have received. We have no other regret than that caused by the loss of our brave companions, and in this we are consoled by the conviction that they have fallen in the holiest cause ever submitted in the arbitrament of battle. The army's provost marshal, Marcina Patrick, saw it in far less romantic terms. I feel perfectly disheartened and cannot see the end of this war. It is now in the hands of gamblers, he bemoaned. Soldiers in the Union army, dispirited, felt more like they'd been cheated rather than defeated. We marched, we fought, we failed, wrote one Indiana soldier. We were not defeated, but we did not defeat. Blame came to rest squarely on Hooker's shoulders. Brigadier General Alphys Williams summed up the armies and the public's feelings pretty well. We have lost physically and numerically, but still more morally, by universal want of confidence in the commanding officer. Indeed, it was Joe Hooker who sent George Stoneman on a fool's errand. It was Hooker, too, who misinterpreted Lee's intentions time and again and it was Mr. F. J. Hooker who gave up the initiative. Thus, he gave up the battle. 
The commanding general did all he could in the post-Chancellorsville fallout to blame others for his shortcoming. On May 22nd, Cavalry Chief George Stoneman received the axe. Hooker blamed him and his troopers for not forcing Lee to withdraw to the south. In Hooker's estimation, since the Confederate rail line seemed to run with regularity into the Fredericksburg area, Lee had no reason to abandon his position for want of supplies. Adding insults to injury, Stoneman's cavalry had received better press than the army commander in the days following Hooker's loss. Hooker blamed 11th Corps commander Oliver Otis Howard as well. In Howard's case, the blame heaped on him was more warranted. Howard was a poor corps commander, yet somehow he survived Hooker's wrath, and as a result would go on to suffer a similar calamitous collapse on the Union right flank at Gettysburg just two months later. Hooker also came down on the Sixth Corps' Uncle John Sedgwick, despite the fact that Sedgwick's 23,000 men had performed well under trying conditions, fighting three battles in two days, sustaining more than 4,600 casualties, the most of any Federal Corps at Chancellorsville. What was Hooker there for? pondered Sixth Corps Staff Officer R. F. Halstead. To entrench himself with Sixth Corps under his command and expect and even order one single corps to march right through the enemy, to crush and destroy, were the words of his order to the general, any force which might oppose itself to our march. Once Hooker besmirched Sedgwick, Hooker's cadre of corps commanders began quietly, then not so quietly, whispering in the ears of politicians. Many of the corps and their division commanders wanted Hooker out. Putting the fault of the loss of battle at Howard's and Stoneman's feet was one thing, but to place blame on Sedgwick and his men was farcical at best, and experienced officers knew it. Through all of the backbiting, the spirit of the Federal soldiers remained high. We must not give up the ship, one of them wrote. This rebellion must be crushed, if it takes every man of the North to do it. Let the recruits come forward and fill up this army, and we will try them again and again, if need be, until we succeed. Hooker would retain command of the army until late June, when the mounting frustrations between him, General-in-Chief Henry Halleck, and President Lincoln finally led to Hooker's removal. On June 28, Major General George Gordon Meade would replace him, just days before the two armies clashed in the crossroads town of Gettysburg. Robert E. Lee, meanwhile, was incensed that he missed his opportunity to destroy those people. The old man seemed to be feeling so real wicked, Confederate artillerist E. P. Alexander said of Lee. In placing the troops in position on the morning of the 6th to attack General Hooker, it was ascertained he had abandoned his fortified position, Lee wrote to Jefferson Davis on May 7th. The line of skirmishers was pressed forward until they came within range of the enemy's batteries planted north of the Rappahannock, which, from the configuration of the ground, completely commanded this side. His army therefore escaped with the loss of a few additional prisoners. Although disappointed, Lee was able to squelch the majority of his anger at losing what he felt was his golden opportunity to destroy the Army of the Potomac in detail. The reality of the situation was that it was better for Lee's army that they did not attack Hooker's wing on May 4th through 6th. Hooker's engineers had laid out a line that was nearly impregnable to assault. Fresh earth was churned and trees felled to construct earthen fortifications. Six Federal Infantry Corps were ensconced behind those works, and two of those corps had only been lightly engaged. Thus Hooker had fresh troops, whereas Lee's entire army had slugged it out with Hooker. Cannon, too, ringed the new Union defensive line, which anchored both flanks on the river. With only 30,000 men to engage Hooker's 75,000 near Chancellorsville, his only true corps commander, Stonewall Jackson out of action, and the adverse nature of the terrain, he would have been better served focusing on the destruction of Sedgwick's force at Banks Ford. When Lee's men finally did attempt to tangle with Sedgwick on May 4th, the assaults were disjointed and failed miserably. At Chancellorsville we gained another victory. Our people were wild with delight, Lee wrote. I, on the contrary, was more depressed than after Fredericksburg. Our loss was severe, and again we had gained not an inch of ground, and the enemy could not be pursued. As always, Lee tried to make the best of the situation. With heartfelt gratification, the general commanding expresses to this army his sense of the heroic conduct displayed by the officers and men 
during the arduous operations in which they have just been engaged, Lee wrote in his General Order No. 59. While this glorious victory entitles you to the praise and gratitude of the nation, we are especially called upon to return our grateful thanks to the only giver of victory for the signal deliverance he has wrought. Compared to their northern counterparts, the Confederate army lost twenty-two percent of its men, totaling nearly thirteen thousand killed, wounded, and missing. Nine of Lee's general officers numbered amongst the casualties, as did sixty-four of his one hundred thirty regimental commanders. The most grievous loss for the Confederates was Stonewall Jackson, who died of pneumonia on Sunday, May 10th, at 3.15 in the afternoon. "'I know not how to replace him,' Lee later said. Lee did try, though. On May 7th, one day after the campaign concluded, Lee began sending to Richmond his recommendations for the promotions. As May pressed on, Lee reorganized his army from two to three infantry corps. He also began looking to carry the war into the north. On June 3rd, utilizing the momentum his army had so dearly bought at Chancellorsville, Lee opened what would become known as the Gettysburg Campaign. Robert E. Lee and his vaunted Army of Northern Virginia would go from their greatest victory at Chancellorsville to their greatest battlefield defeat at Gettysburg. Although the war continued for two more years, the Battle of Chancellorsville represented the high-water mark for the Confederacy. The Army of Northern Virginia never again won an offensive battlefield victory. Appendix A. The Rivers and Fords Meandering through the wilderness of Spotsylvania, Orange, and Culpeper counties are two natural barriers, the Rapidan and Rappahannock Rivers. During the war, the rivers saw men march off to battle, heads held high. They saw many of those same men take refuge along their banks, broken and battered, but not defeated. Yet even before the war, the two rivers were important features of the wilderness. The shallow Rapidan River emerges from the Shenandoah Valley and flows eastward until it reaches the Rappahannock River northwest of the city of Fredericksburg. One of the earliest settlements along the river, Germana, was located near where modern-day Route 3 crosses the river into Culpeper County. The ford at Germana became a major crossing point for the Union and Confederate armies throughout the Civil War. In particular, it was a key route for movement during the Chancellorsville Campaign, as well as the Wilderness Campaign in 1864, as was Ely's Ford, a little further downriver. Larger than the Rapidan, the Rappahannock boasted Banks Ford, United States Ford, and Kelly's Ford, as well as several lesser fords. On the river's shore sat the strategically placed city of Fredericksburg. Deep-water ships could navigate to the city to pick up goods brought in from the Virginia Piedmont. From Fredericksburg, steamers could then follow the river southeast into the Chesapeake Bay, where they could then turn north and head to Fredericksburg's sister city, Baltimore, Maryland. Throughout the winter of 1862-63, Confederate pickets had outposts at many of the Rappahannock's crossing points. Union engineers, meanwhile, spent the winter scouting the sites, taking notes on the river's depth, the base material at each crossing, and whether artillery or wagons could be moved across at each point. Then, just prior to the start of the Chancellorsville campaign, the Union Army secured many of the fords to facilitate the Army's sweeping flanking movement. Once across the rivers, the Army needed the fords for transportation and communication. Once the battle opened, Confederates failed in their attempts to cut the Union Army off from the major crossing sites. This proved invaluable to the Federals, who eventually used the crossings to retreat to safety. During the 1864 campaign, the Union Army's II Corps crossed the Rapidan at Ely's Ford, while the rest of the Army crossed at Germana. This time, Federal soldiers would never again retreat across the river in failure. The Union commander, Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant, drove south toward Richmond, and never turned back. Today, many of the river crossings still exist, although some are on private property. However, Ely's Ford on Route 610 is a public boat launch. Visitors are encouraged to take the short drive north and visit the ford. From the Chancellorsville intersection, travel north on Route 610 for approximately six miles. Notice how shallow the river is, and look at the rocky base, both of which made crossing easier. To speed movements, the Union Army would lay temporary bridges, known as pontoon bridges, for artillery and supply wagons.
The steep banks demonstrate what formidable geographic barriers rivers in Virginia could be, which made fords all that much more important. Because the banks are so steep, please do be careful near the edges. Appendix B. Stoneman's Raid By Daniel T. Davis and Philip S. Greenwald In the tangled underbrush and scrub oak west of Chancellorsville, Robert E. Lee achieved his greatest victory over Major General Joseph Hooker and the Army of the Potomac. In the months and years following the battle, Hooker would attempt to shift responsibility for the loss to the feet of his senior subordinates. One of Hooker's targets was the leader of his cavalry corps, Major General George Stoneman. During the campaign, Hooker detached Stoneman and more than two-thirds of Stoneman's 10,000-man cavalry force on one expedition into central Virginia to operate in Lee's rear. In Hooker's mind, Stoneman's lack of success in this endeavor directly contributed to his defeat at Chancellorsville. However, a closer examination reveals that the commander of the Army of the Potomac may have been more responsible for his cavalry's lack of success than he would wish to acknowledge. When Hooker was appointed to command the Army of the Potomac in January 1863, one of his first acts was to consolidate his mounted forces. On February 6th, Hooker issued General Order No. 6 to the Army, which directed Brigadier General George Stoneman to head the newly formed Cavalry Corps. Hooker's choice for command was a native of New York. Stoneman was West Point educated, where he was roommates with future Confederate General Stonewall Jackson, and had served as George McClellan's Chief of Cavalry earlier in the war. His most recent assignment was leading the Third Corps during the Fredericksburg Campaign. In his preparations for the upcoming campaign, Hooker planned to give Stoneman and his troopers a critical role. Rather than assail Lee head-on, Hooker decided on a much more elaborate strategy. He would send his cavalry up the Rappahannock in a northwesterly direction, crossing well upstream from Lee's left flank. Stoneman would then swing southeast to damage and cut Lee's lines of communication. This maneuver would undoubtedly force Lee to retire from his Fredericksburg line. With the Confederates in full retreat, Hooker's infantry would follow virtually unopposed. It was the Army commander's hope that Stoneman, already being in position to oppose and harass Lee's retreat, would hold the Southerners in place long enough for the foot soldiers to arrive. The decisive battle would then be fought between Fredericksburg and Richmond. On April 12th, orders came down from Army headquarters for Stoneman. This directive was both detailed and stringent as to Hooker's intentions for his mounted arm. You will march for the purpose of turning the enemy's position on his left and of throwing your command between him and Richmond and isolating him from his supplies, checking his retreat, and inflicting on him every possible injury which will tend to his discomfiture and defeat. Once across the Rappahannock River, Hooker outlined Stoneman's next movement. It is expected that you will be able to push forward to the Acquire and Richmond Railroad, destroying along your whole route the railroad bridges, trains, cars, depots of provisions, lines of communications. As the line of the railroad presents the shortest one for the enemy to retire on, it is more than probable that the enemy may avail himself of it, in which event you will select the strong positions in order to check or prevent it. He will fall upon his flanks and harass and delay him. In closing, Hooker stated that the primary object of Stoneman's assignment was the cutting of the enemy's connections with Richmond by the Fredericksburg route, checking his retreat over those lines, and making everything subservient to that object. The next morning, Stoneman set out, bound for the fords along the upper Rappahannock. It seemed that Hooker had taken every precaution to prepare for his offensive, but he could not count on Mother Nature. Rain came in torrents, and soon the Rappahannock was flooding and preventing any crossing. These conditions continued for the next two weeks. On April 28th, Stoneman was called to a council of war at Morrisville, Virginia. Due to the weather delay, Hooker had decided to adjust his initial plan. Stoneman would still move out into the enemy's rear, but rather than waiting for the Confederates to retreat, Hooker would send his infantry immediately after the cavalry around Lee's left wing. On the morning of April 29th, the cavalry finally began crossing the river. Adhering to his instructions from the previous day, Stoneman dispatched Brigadier General William Averill's division to operate against the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. Stoneman then marched south, navigating a crossing of the Rapidan, and rode to Louisa. There his troopers wreaked havoc on the Virginia Central Railroad, 
Leaving Louisa behind, Stoneman continued on toward Yanceyville and Thompson's Crossroads. At Thompson's Crossroads, Stoneman divided his command and sent them across the countryside to damage bridges and the railroads. These columns wrought destruction across the Virginia countryside. On May 5th, Stoneman still had not heard from Hooker. What he did hear was less than encouraging. Locals had been sharing news of yet another Union defeat. The cavalry commander decided it was time to make his return trip. The weary troopers marched north, and by the night of May 8th had all recrossed the Rappahannock to safety. Upon his return to the army, Stoneman learned that Averill had not fared well in his assignment. His subordinate had marched his division through Culpeper Courthouse and to Rapidan Station. Surprisingly, while Averill was engaging Confederate cavalry there, he was recalled by Hooker on the morning of May 2nd. Averill reached the Army of the Potomac near the Chancellorsville battlefield later that evening. Early the next morning, in a stunning turn of events, Hooker drafted an order relieving Averill from command. It would not be long before Hooker turned his attention to his cavalry chief. A Massachusetts cavalier wrote home, Hooker, it is said, angrily casting about for someone to blame for his repulse, as, of all men, hit upon Stoneman. Afflicted with hemorrhoids and, perhaps, reading the writing on the wall, Stoneman took a leave of absence from the Army of the Potomac, never to return. He would serve the rest of the war in various assignments in Washington and out west. Hooker still had to justify his own actions to his superiors. In doing so, he attempted to paint Stoneman's raid as an abject failure and lay the blame for the Chancellorsville disaster at the feet of George Stoneman. The first accusation flew on May 10th, while Stoneman was still in command. Hooker reported to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton that the raid does not appear to have amounted to much. Two years later, during his testimony to the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, Hooker testified in regards to Stoneman that no officer made a greater mistake in construing his orders, and no one accomplished less in doing so. However, these accusations are unfair for numerous reasons. For starters, Stoneman could not control the weather. The delay caused by the torrential rain and rising river depths skewered the timetable for the raid. What also slipped Hooker's recollection was the fact that mid-campaign he changed the role of his infantry, from being on the offensive to consolidating their position around Chancellorsville. So, instead of following Lee's army when it was supposed to retreat, according to Hooker's well-thought-out maneuvers, the Army of the Potomac instead dug in, and Hooker waited for Lee to assault his fortified lines. With this change, unbeknownst to Stoneman, the only time Lee's Confederates would retreat would be after suffering terribly from the futile offensive against the dug-in Federals. How was Stoneman supposed to check the retreat of Lee's army when Hooker was not providing the pressure to drive the Confederates from the field? Another consideration is the initial and subsequent orders issued to Stoneman. Hooker's instructions were stringent concerning what course of action his cavalry should take. These orders specifically did not allow room for Stoneman to compensate and adjust to the ever-changing situation of combat. When Hooker elected to transition to the defensive, he failed to notify Stoneman and adjust his original plans for his cavalry. What is even more confounding is Hooker's relief of General William Averill. Averill was acting under instructions from Stoneman, derived from the orders received on April 28th. Hooker's summoning of Averill back to the army deprived Stoneman of more than 3,000 troopers. These troopers could very well have assisted in breaking and further damaging the Confederate infrastructure along with the rest of their comrades. On a lesser yet more sentimental note, Stoneman delayed Marianna Jackson from reaching her husband, Stonewall Jackson, as he lay on his sick bed at Guinea Station because the railroad needed to be repaired. At the same time, the disruption of the railroad virtually guaranteed that a small plantation office owned by Thomas Chandler would become a shrine to the lost cause. To contend that Stoneman's raid was doomed from the outset would be a misstatement. A closer examination of the facts reveals that any perceived failure should rest on the shoulders of Joseph Hooker rather than George Stoneman. Hooker's strict orders, diverging from his original plan without informing his subordinate and the removal of Averill's division, all served to handicap Stoneman. Despite the controversy that resulted, the most important effect the raid had was on the morale of the blue-clad cavalrymen who participated. The raid was their first experience operating as a combined command, and instilled in them a sense of confidence, importance, and expectation. Stoneman's raid provided the catalyst for the turnaround of this branch of the service. 
Less than a month after the cavalry arrived, fatigued from the raid back in camp, they struck their enemy at Brandy Station. Stoneman's raid will forever be known as the end of the nadir of the Union cavalry. It served as a rebuilt foundation for its ascent to supremacy over their Confederate counterparts in the East. Appendix C. Jackson's Flank Attack Reconsidered by Ryan T. Quint The Battle of Chancellorsville is most famous for Stonewall Jackson's flank march and his ensuing wounding on the mountain road. Due to the popularity of Jackson, his flank attack has been presented as a movement of absolute military brilliance. But was such the case? Jackson's ultimate goal was the U.S. Ford, about five miles as the crow flies from where his attack bogged down. If he could get to the Ford and capture it, he would block a major escape route for the Army of the Potomac and put Hooker in a tight fix. However, those five miles separating Jackson and the Ford were through the heart of the wilderness, and his command had already become entangled in the thick brush. What is more, a series of roads heading to the U.S. Ford were all under firm federal control. Still, Jackson was not about to quit without trying. But what did he have left? Robert Rhodes and Raleigh Colston's divisions were both used up in routing the Eleventh Corps. Though neither of the commands had suffered heavy casualties, the wilderness had played havoc with their alignments, and the men had become hindered in the federal camps looting tents and filling their haversacks. That left Jackson only the division of A.P. Hill. As Hill rode up to Jackson in the growing darkness on the Orange Turnpike, the latter ordered, Press them, Hill! Cut them off from the United States Ford! Press them! That demand bordered on the impossible. Because the success of the flank attack has been over-exaggerated in hindsight, many students of history forget that, the Eleventh Corps notwithstanding, the Army of the Potomac was still a very dangerous threat on the night of May 2nd. A.P. Hill's division was to advance through the wilderness, force the retreat of the Federals in front of them, and capture the U.S. Ford, all before the rapidly descending darkness cancelled further fighting. Starting the day's march near where Jackson and Robert E. Lee had met for their Cracker Box Conference, the light division was composed of six brigades, but the day's events had slimmed down the ranks. Two brigades had been detached to fight a rear-guard action at the Catherine Furnace against the Federal Third Corps earlier in the day. The four remaining brigades were just as entangled from their advance down the turnpike in the aftermath of the flank attack as their comrades were in Rhodes and Colston's commands. The Army of the Potomac was more than ready to receive any assault those four brigades might have made toward the U.S. Ford. At the time Jackson's command had hit the Eleventh Corps, George Meade's Fifth Corps was directly on the road to U.S. Ford and had begun to swing down into Ely's Ford Road with its center near the Bullock House. While Meade moved his corps onto its impromptu line, the First Corps, under the command of John Reynolds, began to arrive at the U.S. Ford. In essence, had Jackson actually gotten Hill's attack off on the night of May 2nd, the four Confederate brigades would have run smack into the entirety of the Fifth Corps and pieces of the First Corps, both under capable commanders. The Fifth Corps had about 15,300 men on May 2nd. The First Corps, although not entirely up, numbered close to 17,000 men. Against this mass of more than 32,000 Federals, Hill's four brigades had about 8,000 men to attack with. In addition to being outnumbered, Hill's men also had to contend with the wilderness. We commenced the advance, one officer recalled, but soon found ourselves entangled in an almost impenetrable thicket. In sum, the four brigades with Hill had virtually no chance of capturing the U.S. Ford, even if the disaster on the mountain road had not occurred. By looking at the factors above, it's apparent that Jackson's flank attack was not the end-all be-all that some histories would have us believe. The Army of the Potomac was still in a strong position, and it would take brutal, bloody fighting by the entirety of the Army of Northern Virginia the next morning to dispel them. Appendix D. The Chancellors of Chancellorsville by Rebecca Oakes in 1876, a woman named Sue Chancellor, along with a faction of family members, boarded a train from Fredericksburg, Virginia, to Philadelphia, bound for the celebration of the United States Centennial. En route, they were approached by a distinguished-looking gentleman seated near the party, who inquired as to whether they were the Chancellors of Chancellorsville, Virginia. Receiving an affirmative reply, the man introduced himself as Major General Joseph Hooker, 
former commander of the Army of the Potomac. Sue had last seen General Hooker as a young girl thirteen years earlier, during a three-day battle that not only ensured the Chancellor family name would live in American memory for the next one hundred fifty years, but also brought profound and sudden change to their lives. This family's experiences, before, during, and after the Civil War, offer a lens through which the changes on Southern society wrought by four years of conflict can be observed. Despite its institutional name, Chancellorsville was not a town, but a well-known landmark, a large brick home that had served as a tavern and inn for travelers along the Orange Turnpike for many years. Long before the Civil War, an entrepreneurial spirit swept across central Virginia. In this fervor, Chancellorsville was erected in conjunction with the construction of the Orange Turnpike. This road was a new thoroughfare that connected the Piedmont of Orange Courthouse with the port of Fredericksburg. Chancellorsville was given to George Chancellor and his wife Anne as a wedding gift from Anne's brother. Thus, George looked to take advantage of the new roadway, which carried travelers and merchants right past his front door. By 1816, Chancellor was able to advertise lodgings in a home large and commodious for the entertainment of travelers. The plantation complex also included a farrier and a post office. Despite slowing trade with the emergence of railroads in the 1840s and 1850s, the home continued to operate as a tavern under the management of various relatives until Anne Chancellor's death in 1860. The wartime residents of the home were Frances Chancellor, the widow of George's younger brother Sanford, her seven youngest children, and the number of slaves. Sanford died in 1860, leaving Francis to acquire the property in 1861. It was not long before the war's effect reached Chancellorsville. In 1862, Francis and her children hosted refugees from the Battle of Fredericksburg, displaced civilians who had left the town for the countryside. The Chancellors willingly housed the Forbes family, their two daughters, and at least two of their slaves. In addition to refugees, the Chancellor family was also catering to Confederate troops stationed in the area. Sue, fourteen years old at the time, remembered her earliest interaction with Confederate pickets who received meals from her mother. We had plenty of servants then, she described, and my mother was a good provider, so they thought themselves in clover. This was a time of prosperity and even joy for the Chancellor girls and their Confederate guests. The Chancellor daughters embraced their roles as hostesses and received considerable courtly attention in return. The girls entertained the soldiers by playing the piano and singing, while their Confederate cohorts returned the favor by teaching them to play cards. Even young Sue received particular attention, most notably when a soldier from South Carolina, Thomas Lamar Stark, purchased a lamb for the young girl to keep as a pet. She proceeded to name the lamb Lamar in recognition of Stark's gift. Although Confederate troops and refugees were an interruption to the family's daily life, a sense of camaraderie and mutual support for other Southerners permeated these early interactions. However, signs of change certainly began appearing during the winter of 1862-63. Following the Emancipation Proclamation, issued on January 1, 1863, soon noted that their servants ran away to the Yankees, who were, I think, not very far away in Stafford County. Social upheavals brought on by war and the presence of federal forces in the South made the self-emancipation of slaves common, and the Chancellor Plantation was no exception. Interactions between the Chancellor family and Union soldiers took on a very different nature than their Confederate counterparts. The family first encountered federal troops during the initial occupation of Fredericksburg in the spring of 1862. Sue described her sisters as being far less present toward these men and her mother's concern with hiding the family stock of food instead of sharing it. Sue also described the fear that permeated these encounters. On the whole, however, the Yankees were kind and polite to us, but I can remember how they used to come in a sweeping gallop up the big road, and how I would run and hide and pray. Although the damage done by these early raids was much more psychological than physical, fear of the destruction the Union Army could bring was clearly present. The Battle of Chancellorsville drastically transformed the lives of the family. In a few short days, federal officers would commandeer the family home, the Chancellors would experience war firsthand, and eventually they would become refugees themselves. On April 30th, Confederate forces initially occupying the property fell back from the river, and federal infantry, including Army Commander Major General Joseph Hooker, 
seized the house as headquarters for the Army of the Potomac. Chancellorsville's residents, numbering sixteen women and children, were initially relegated to a back room. As the battle commenced, Chancellorsville served not only as headquarters, but, as was common for most residences on or near battlefields, as a field hospital. The chancellors and their guests were ordered to the cellar, where they huddled, cold and terrified, in a few inches of standing water. Along the way they passed a scene of great horror. The family piano had been turned into an operating table, and later, Sue would describe, the piles of legs and arms outside of the sitting-room window, and the rows and rows of dead bodies covered with canvas. Even the children were not shielded from the carnage of war. On the morning of May 3rd, the Chancellor family's horrifying experience culminated when their home caught fire, and they were evacuated amidst the raging battle. Sue recollects that the woods around the house were a sheet of fire, horses were running, rearing, and screaming, the men a mass of confusion, moaning, cursing, and praying, until eventually our old home was completely enveloped in flames. Long known for providing shelter, the family was almost instantaneously rendered homeless. The family was aided in escaping the fire by a Union officer, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Dickinson of Hooker's staff, who not only accompanied the women out of the home, but over three miles through the Union lines to ensure that the party of women and children made it safely across the river. When questioned by another officer about why he was not at his post of duty, Dickinson reportedly replied, If here is not the post of duty, looking after the safety of these helpless women and children, then I don't know what you call duty. Dickinson's actions not only saved the Chancellor family from possible suffocation, but also spawned a friendship between Dickinson and Francis Chancellor that would last until her death. The Chancellors would spend the remainder of the war as refugees in Charlottesville, Virginia, continuing to interact with the armies while working in military hospitals. During this time, another tragedy struck. Two of the daughters, Abby and Fanny, contracted typhoid fever, possibly as a result of the number of hospitals in the town, and died within a week of each other. The war years robbed young Sue Chancellor of her home, her innocence, and now two of her sisters. After the war, the Chancellor scattered throughout the country. Although Sue married a cousin, a Spasian Chancellor, and continued to live in Fredericksburg, life was markedly different. Instead of the Chancellor family being well known for their grand and hospitable family home, they were known for their role in one of the bloodiest battles in American history. Years later, Sue would reflect that the horrible impression of those days of agony and conflict is still vivid, and I can close my eyes and see again the blazing woods, the house in flames, the flying shot and shell, and the terror-stricken women and children pushing their way over the dead and wounded, led by the courageous and chivalrous Colonel Dickinson. Perhaps it was the kindness of Dickinson that allowed the family's opinion of the Union Army to mellow as time. Perhaps it was reconciliationist fervor beginning to grip the nation. Or perhaps, even after losing their home, the Chancellors did not abandon their penchant for hospitality. For when the Chancellors met Joseph Hooker on a train in 1876, they did not greet him with spite. With the man who witnessed their home burn thirteen years previously, they shared a large and pleasant lunch. Appendix E. Matthew Fontaine Morey by Christopher D. White On many maps it is simply labeled the Brick House. Yet the two-story brick home that stood here, built between 1820 and 1821, had its own historic importance. It was built on the site where Matthew Fontaine Morey was born. Despite coming from such a landlocked part of Virginia, Morey would eventually become known as the father of modern oceanography. Morey was born in an unassuming house in 1806, but the family would spend little time in Spotsylvania County. By the time Morey was four, his family moved to Franklin, Tennessee. Although Morey did not live near the ocean, it called to him. At the age of nineteen, he disobeyed his father's wishes and entered the United States Navy, eventually earning commission as a midshipman. One of his first assignments would be to accompany the hero Marquis de Lafayette back to France, following Lafayette's post-war tour of the United States. Morey's seagoing days were cut short, though, at the age of thirty-three, when he was seriously injured in a stagecoach accident. In 1842, Morey accepted the prestigious assignment as 
the first superintendent of the United States Naval Observatory. The post allowed him to study many aspects of the world's oceans, including meteorology and currents, and he learned the intricacies of modern naval equipment. Morey also pored over the charts and logbooks of ship captains, collecting as much information as possible on the world's oceans. This would open the seas for further exploration, while also helping more ships navigate more safely. Morey's work encompassed not only the world's oceans, but also the world's land masses and even its meteorology. Foreign leaders were so impressed that they helped fund his research, even though the United States refused to. Believing that the United States needed a school for sailors, Morey became an outspoken advocate for the creation of the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland. When war erupted between the states, though, Morey chose to leave his successful career with the Navy to side with the Confederacy. He was, by some accounts, the world's most famous Southerner to join the Confederate cause. Although Morey did not see active service with the Confederacy, he traveled abroad to secure ships and supplies for the fledgling Confederate Navy. He also put his scientific knowledge to work, inventing an electric torpedo which, for its time, was quite effective. Following the war, Morey accepted a position to teach at the Virginia Military Institute. He was also a driving force behind the creation of the Virginia Agricultural and Mechanical College, modern-day Virginia Tech. While living in Lexington, Morey struck up a friendship with the president of Washington College, Robert E. Lee. When Lee died in 1870, Morey was asked to be a pallbearer. Morey lived in Lexington until his own death on February 1, 1873. He was first buried in the Lexington City Cemetery, but later his remains were exhumed and reburied in Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, overlooking the James River. A large bronze statue, honoring Morey's contributions to science, sits sentinel along Richmond's Monument Avenue. Dedicated on November 11, 1929, it was the last of the Civil War statues placed along the famed boulevard. Today there is little evidence of the original house, or the brick house. We encourage the visitor to walk out and read the park's interpretive signs, and get a feel for the wilderness, too. Thank you for listening to this audio presentation of That Furious Struggle, Chancellorsville and the High Tide of the Confederacy, May 1st through 4th, 1863, by Charles McCaskey and Christopher D. White, read for you by Bob Neufeld. Text, copyrights 2014, by Chris McCaskey and Christopher D. White. Production copyright 2019 by Savas Beatty. You can find more titles in the Emerging Civil War series online at the publisher's website, www.savasbeatty.com, that's S-A-V-A-S-B-E-A-T-I-E dot com, or on the Emerging Civil War site, www.emergingcivilwar.com.